Yeah. She'll just have to walk just with me up. Yeah. And then, like, at one point, she'll be like, yes, I'm going to come out and try to get the water and just, like, she does. Except for the other one. She will. She will. She will. She will. She 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 She
People v. James Crumbly, case number 22279989FH. Thank you. Good morning, Mark. Peace on behalf of the people. Akira McDonald on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Marielle Lehman on behalf of James Crumbly, who is standing to my left. I just want to make sure you can hear. Can you hear us, Mr. Crumbly? No. Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, ready for the who's about, Who's the next witness? Detective Adam Stoya. All right, ready for the hearing? Yes, Your Honor. Do you 
swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give as a true step up to God. I do. Right, please step up. Have a seat. And then would you state the name for the record? It's probably your first and last name. Adam Stoyak, A D A M S T O Y E K. Go ahead, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, while we get started, we're going to see if we can oh. check the connection here. There's something down in the chambers, too, on your. Is that connected at all? No. What is that mean? I'm going to stab it. Thank you, sir. And how are you employed? I'm a detective with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. I'm assigned to the city of Pontiac. Okay. How long have you been a police officer? Twelve years. Right around twelve years. And how long have you been a detective? Right around four years. Okay. You said you're assigned to Pontiac? Yeah, the city of Pontiac substation. Okay. Now, I want to direct your attention to November the 30th, 2021. Do you remember that day? I do. Okay. Were you working? I was. We heard testimony yesterday regarding a search warrant at 112 East in, the, in Oxford, the Crumbly family home. Did you participate in that search warrant? I did. Okay. Now, if you could tell us, please, what happens um, when a house is secured for a search warrant? Yeah, so securing a house prior to uh, getting the search warrant, you're going to go initially and just kind of do an initial sweep of the house to make sure no one's inside the house. Um, <laughs> No one's injured inside of the house, and then after that, you're just going to secure the house until you get the authorization from the judge, um, just for like preservation of evidence and make sure that if there is evidence inside the house, that it's not tampered with. Okay, and did you do that in this case? I did. And who else was with you? Uh, Detective McPherson, Detective Steele, uh, Detective Peschke, Deputy Zajac, uh, Deputy Mozak, and uh, Prepper Hinden was there too. From the ATF? Correct. Okay. Now, when you were sent to that location, did you know what would be found there? No. Okay. And when were you assigned with this task? Um, after, after we initially searched the school, um, my supervisor at the time was Sergeant Hicks. He uh, gathered a few, a few of us up and said to go to 112 East Street and secure the residence. Okay. So you responded to the school first, and then you were tasked with securing the, the residence at 112 East in Oxford? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to show you what's been admitted as... People's 270. Sir, is this a photograph? This photograph fairly and amply depicts the address at 112 East? It does. Okay. Describe the layout for us of the home. Yeah, so it's, uh, when you walk in here, that's the front of the residence that faces East Street. Um, walk in um, to your immediate right, there's a living room area with a couch, there's a TV. Um, you walk into the left, it was like the uh, dining room, there was a table, chairs. Um, through that, there was a kitchen. Um, off the kitchen, there was two bedrooms, one on the right, one on the left, a bathroom. Yeah, I'm going to show you what's yeah. been in it as well. It's 205. Is this a sketch of the home? Correct. Okay. And so we have a front entrance at the top of the diagram here? Correct. Okay. Can you just walk us through here? Yeah. So uh, where the sheriff's emblem sign is there is the front of the residence. Um, you walk in. So be on the left of this picture here is the living room. Um, there's some couches, there's a TV stand, uh, a table. 
to the right there of that was the dining room. There's a, like a kitchen table, um, some chairs. I think there was some workout equipment in there. Um, past that, there's a little opening right there, which led to the kitchen, uh, refrigerator island, some cabinets. Um, so right there to the left um, would be the entrance. There's a little hallway to two bedrooms. There's one bedroom. That's north bedroom. There's a bathroom in between that. And then across the hallway, there was labeled middle bedroom. Uh, was the bedrooms. And then uh, you come out of there. There was a little hallway. Uh, there was an opening to like the landing that led to the basement, the foyer. Um, and then it was what was the master bedroom was immediately past that. Okay. Now, prior to participating in the search of this home, did you learn which bedrooms were associated with the shooter? I did. Which one? So, in this picture here, you'd see North bedroom was one of the shooter's bedrooms, and then directly across the hallway, which is labeled the middle bedroom there, was also the shooter's bedroom. Okay, so his rooms were, what we have labeled here is North bedroom, and then middle bedroom. Both are adjacent to the bathroom, and middle bedroom is adjacent to the master bedroom. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Now tell us, <clears throat> when you first entered the home to secure it for a search warrant, did you see anything of note? Yeah, so obviously we, you're, you're kind of just doing the search, but you're obviously still, if, you're, if you see things, you take a mental note of what you see. Um, and when I walked into what I was described as the master bedroom, there was an open uh, six-hour gun box on the bed, and next to that was an empty box of a uh, nine-millimeter ammunition okay. on the bed as well. Did you touch that? I did not, no. Okay. So when you see something like that, what do you do? Yeah, you just kind of take a mental note of it. Um, and obviously, once you get the authorization from the judge and the search warrant, you're going to go um, search the house, and my partner and I were tasked with searching that bedroom, so okay. we were aware before we came in. So after the home was secured, and you confirmed that, well, first of all, when it was secured, did you encounter either James or Jennifer Crumley? I did. I had a uh, brief encounter with James Crumley. Okay, is he in court today? He is. Can you please point to him and describe something he's wearing? Uh, he's wearing the suit with the blue shirt and the blue tie. You're yeah. with the record reflect identification defendant? The record is still reflect. Okay. Tell us where you encountered James Crumley when you arrived on scene. Uh, when I initially got there, he was secured in, I don't remember who, Deputy Mozak or Deputy Zajac's uh, patrol vehicle. Okay. Now, if an admitted video of, an, uh, of a patrol video indicated 2.46 p.m. arrival on November the 30th, 2021, does that seem right to you? Yes. Okay. Did you speak with Mr. Kremlin? I did. Okay. Um, did you speak with him on scene there or when he was transported to the substation? So I had a brief conversation with him prior or at the substation, really nothing of note. And we, he was taken back to the uh, residence, and that's where I had more of a, not in depth, but more of a conversation with him outside of the residence. Okay. So I'm going to show you and play what's been admitted as People's 300. This is the in-car video that you referenced. This one is the bottom one. Thank you. Have a seat right now. Why is she in here? I don't know. Can you take the handcuffs off from the please? Okay. Button first. Okay. 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 It's not going to be long until those handcuffs are crossed. Why am I in a cuff, though? It hurts. Like, it really hurts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I asked him the same fucking thing. They didn't do anything.
Transported to the substation and taken back. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's a lot going on. So it, initially, we were kind of instructed to take James to the substation and interview him. Um, after a conversation with, I believe, Sergeant Bryan, it was determined that he had already spoken with uh, detectives prior to us getting there. So he was taken back to the house um, while we were waiting for the search warrant to be uh, completed. Okay, so we heard testimony this, in this trial that Sergeant Bryan began that interview at 1:58 p.m. And this occurred after that, is that right? Yeah, it was after okay. the initial interview. Did you have some conversation with James about obtaining a search warrant for the home? Yeah, I had a brief conversation with him. Okay. Did you let him know you were looking for firearms? I did, yes. Okay. And would that conversation have been recorded on the in-car video system as well? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been admitted and played for you. Is it 204? This is a portion of the in-car video from 3.42 p.m. on November the 30th. Hey man. Hey, so let me just grab your name real quick. I know you already got it, but I don't know what I'm talking to you. Can you just spell it? James. Yep. Yo, my middle name too? No, what's your last name? Crumbly, C R U M D L D Y. What's your phone number? 6483. Okay. So what's going on is we're waiting for. Uh, to complete the search warrant, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to, you guys, obviously, while we're waiting to go into the house, we can't have you guys go back in right now. Just wait until we get the search warrant. So you're more than welcome to either sit in here. You're more than welcome to get in your car and hang out until this is done. You're more than welcome to go get a cup of coffee if you want or something, but it's probably going to be a little while. Um, so it's kind of up to you. But while we're waiting for that, we just ask, obviously, please don't go sit inside the house while we're waiting for everything to be done, okay? Okay. Um, in the meantime, can you tell me where those guns are so you don't have to rip your house apart? Is that cool? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Where? They're in a they're in a gun a gun case. It's where like, where we're at the house. Okay. And if you go to the very back of the the, the very back of the house. Where like the Dosky was sitting? Yes. Okay. Yes. And he's nice. He's yeah, yeah, he's nice. So then you guys can just be cognizant of the doors. We have cats. Okay. Okay. Um but if you go into that back bedroom, okay. there's a dresser on the left with the TV sitting yeah. on yeah. Yeah. the very right cabinet door. Okay. Inside of there there's a black gun case in the okay. box. Okay. And then there's 
some 20, there's just, there's only a 20, there's a 22 um, Derringer okay. and a 22 um, kel It's locked? Pistol. The case is locked. Can we, how would we get into that? Do you mind if we get into that? I mean, if you absolutely have to. Is it got like, what kind of, is that a combination on it's it? It's just or? a combination. It, okay. Do you yeah. mind if we, because we're going to have to get the guns, obviously, for now. Yeah, okay, okay. yeah. Do you mind if, okay. Otherwise, I don't want to have to, you know what I mean? Just no, I, I, I'm completely open, and yep. I want you guys to do what you have to do. I mean, zero. Zero. Yep. Zero. Zero. Three zeros? Four. And that's, that's the only, oh, okay. And then in the bedroom to the left of the, um, the left of the bathroom, okay. there is a BB gun. Okay. It's unloaded, okay. but it looks like a freaking assault rifle. Okay. okay. It's, a, it's one of those air... AR-15? Well, it's not AR-15, it's something different, but it's a it's one of those air, you know, air cartridge yeah. oh, I got BB it. guns. Okay, fair enough. Um, okay. But that's just, I mean, that's just sitting out, so don't freak out when you guys see that. It's not a... I appreciate that. Though. Yeah. Are you going to want to hang tight, or are you, what are you guys going to want to do? Well, I mean, where's my wife? I want to, you know... What, what does she want to do? Okay. Do you want to go with your wife, then? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, Brian, am I... You know, sir, you talked to Sergeant Brian earlier? Yes. Okay. He's going to call you when you guys are able to come back, okay? Okay. Fair enough? Um, I'll need my phone back. Somebody has the phone. Um, so backing up just a little bit, can you tell us why Jennifer Crumbly was in cuffs? Yeah, there, there was multiple, there were a few detectives, there was deputies on scene. Um, I didn't take part in placing her in handcuffs. Um, that would have been up to the deputy that put her in handcuffs. And the deputies that arrived were coming right from the school, is that right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, just now in this, this interview with James Crumbly in the back of the car, he told you the combination code was zero, 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 four zero. is that right? Correct. Did you subsequently recover that safe? I did. Was it four zeros or three zeros? It was three zeros. Okay. Did you come to learn what the default code is for that safe? It's yeah, zero, zero, zero. Now, <clears throat> what did you find inside that safe? Yeah, so inside the safe there was a 22 Caltech handgun and a 22 Derringer, which is like a single shot handgun, was inside of the safe and it was opened up. Okay. Once the search warrant was officially authorized by the judge, did you participate in the search of the home? I did. And there are actually two occasions on which detectives entered the home with authorization from the search warrant. Is that correct? Correct. So once was November 30th, the evening of the shooting, and their time was September, I'm sorry, December the 13th? Correct. Okay, both 2021. Obviously. Correct. Right. All right, I'm going to take you through some photographs of the home. Um, First of all, prior to a search warrant being executed of somebody's residence, are photographs taken? They are. Are they taken before or after the home is searched? Uh, before. Okay. So any photograph received from November the 30th, 2021, was taken before the room was searched by an detective? That's correct. This is Exhibit 249. Tell us what we're looking at here. Yes, yeah, so the initial picture, that's the front door of the residence, right? When you walk into your immediate right, there was couches and a TV uh, in the living room area. So I'll try to take us through the home as you would walk through it. So we have the door in, in the frame here? Correct. That's okay. the front door that faces East Street. That's the front door in the living room? Okay. This is 250. What is it? It's just a uh, wider angle. It's the couch that we saw in the initial picture and the other couch that, that, that would be facing the front door. Okay, so if you step into the front door and you turn to your right, this is what you'd be looking at? Correct. All right, this is exhibit 251, what is this? Yeah, same thing, right, you walk in the front door, this would be to your immediate right and kind of straight ahead, there's just the couches and then a chair, table. 
Okay, here's 252. Again, we see the front door. Yep, so that would be, now you'd actually be facing the front door. That was just the TV stand, which had the TV on it towards the front door. Okay, and you told us that there was the living room and then in the same area you, you described the dining room? Correct. Okay. This is exhibit 272. What do we see here? Yep, so that was the dining room. It was uh, some Christmas decorations, a uh, dining room table. And this photograph was taken on December the 13th, 2021? Yes, this was not the night of. So this is if you walk in the front door and you turn to your left, is that right? Correct. Yep, you walk in and your immediate left would be this. And here's 273. What are we seeing here? Yep, so that'd be when you walk into the right was the living room, to the left was the dining room, and directly ahead of the dining room was the doorway that leads to the kitchen, which you can kind of see in the background there is the kitchen. Okay. Here's 274. Yep, so this would just be a, a picture of the kitchen, the island, the refrigerator. And as you can see further down in the picture is the door to the master bedroom. Okay, so this would be if you step towards that hallway, towards the kitchen? Correct. Yeah, if you're, at, you're, you're exiting the living room, there's that little doorway, and that's going to take you right into the kitchen area. Okay, we'll talk more about the kitchen in a few minutes. First, I want to take you through uh, one of the shooter's bedrooms identified as the middle bedroom. Okay. okay, this is exhibit 206. What do we see here? Yep, so that would be, there's a hallway, there's a bedroom to the left, bathroom, bedroom to the right. This is the bedroom to the left, which is the middle bedroom. Um, that was right when you walked into the bedroom, there was a, a bed with uh, various belongings on it, and then on the, on the wall you can see some uh, shooting targets, gun, or targets. Okay, and as a police officer, you've been to a shooting range before, is that right? Correct. Okay, these are the type of targets consistent with what you obtained in a shooting range? Correct. Okay, and this photograph was taken November the 30th, 2021? Yes. This is Exhibit 207, are we in the same room? Same room, just uh, off the bed there, there was that uh, desk with a TV, um, things all over the floor. Um, yeah, that, that was the natural state of the bedroom we got in the house. When you say natural state, that, that's before the detective search it? Yeah, correct. Okay. And this plywood right here, can you tell us about this please? Yeah, so that, um, that part of the bedroom actually leads, that would have been a window that would have gone to the master bedroom. Um, I believe the master bedroom is probably an add-on. Um, so that would be a window that would lead you to the master bedroom. Okay, so so we're making sure we're oriented. This middle bedroom is adjacent to both the master bedroom on one side and then the bathroom on the other. Correct. Okay. This is exhibit 208. Is the same room from a different vantage point? Same room, yep. The, uh, just another little uh, dresser there, the closet on the left. Okay. Exhibit 209. Same thing, just the uh, various things on the floor, clothing, um, the chairs, same bedroom. And exhibit 210? Yep, same bedroom, just kind of an outer shot that shows the, uh, the whole bedroom there. Sir, as a, as a detective, tell us why it's important for someone to capture a, the natural state of something from different angles. Yeah, so I mean, when you conduct a search warrant, obviously you, you want to be cognizant of the fact that it's someone's house. You don't want to tear the house up, but I mean, you're going to go through the house and things are going to get moved around, um, do your best to clean up afterwards. But uh, when you want to, a picture of this can show you what the house looked like right when you walked in. Nothing was changed and what the livable conditions were when we got there. Okay. And is that also why you would take multiple pictures of one bedroom just from different angles? Correct. Yeah, just so you can get a full shot of what the uh, was actually going on inside of the bedroom. This is exhibit 211. Is this also the middle bedroom? That is, yep. It's the closet in the middle bedroom. Exhibit 212, same closet? Same closet, you can see there in the bottom on the chair was the uh, butt of the, uh, which Mr. Crumley described as like the um, rifle style BB gun. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. This is exhibit 213, what do we see here? Yeah, those are the, uh, the targets I described earlier. They're visibly used. Um, they visibly, they have bullet holes in them, multiple bullet holes in both of them. That was on the wall right next to the bed, the shooter's bedroom. This is exhibit 214. Yeah, same thing, just a different angle. Um, that's the bed to your far left and then the, uh, the used shooting target on the top right corner. If there were any other posters or pictures on the wall, that would have been depicted in the photographs of detectives, is that right? Correct. This is exhibit 215. There's a picture of the bed. Um, There's clothing, clothing, some school books, uh, the knife on the bed there. Just There's tons of different stuff on the bed. And so where the, the, the targets that were on the wall, they'd be just where this um, photograph cuts off at the top. Is that yeah, right? just above the bottom, okay. the top part of the target would be, or of this picture where, where the targets would be. 
Okay. Here's 216. What are we looking at here? Yep. So that's a like a nightstand just off the bed. Um, various things on the nightstand. And 242. This is a closer version. Close. Excuse me. A closer photograph of the items on the nightstand. Yep. Correct. It looked like it was um, various spent shell casings. Um, looks like various uh, caliber spent shell casings inside the uh, plastic container, which is on the nightstand, which is directly next to the uh, shooter's bed. And this is exhibit 243. You mentioned the butt of the, the rifle of that gun in an earlier photograph. Is this what you're referring to? Correct. When I was speaking with James earlier, the video you played earlier, you kind of described that was the one he told me not to be uh, freaked out about. Um, it was the BB gun rifle that was on the, uh, in the shooter's bedroom on his computer chair. And that's how it was when it was found. This is exhibit 244. What's this? So that would be part of the dresser there that the TV's on. Um, he had various, there was a notebook there, uh, pencil, stuff like that. His wallet, um, that was on the TV stand. In, in the middle bedroom still? Correct, still the middle bedroom. Okay. And 245, same drawer, different angle? Yeah, correct. Looks like there's a lighter. Um, I believe those are fireworks of some kind. Um, just another notebook, and that was also in the uh, middle bedroom on the dresser there. Okay. And exhibit 246, we're still in the middle bedroom? Yep, still in the middle bedroom, so that's going to be right at the front of the bed. Um, it's a bottle, it looks like it's an empty bottle of Canada House, which is bourbon, whiskey, okay. at the end of the bed. Now I'm going to move on to the north bedroom. This was identified as the shooter's other bedroom? Correct. Okay, so this would be the bedroom on the other side of the bathroom? Yep, so when you came into the out of the kitchen, you made that right. It was a small hallway straight ahead of the bathroom. To the right was going to be the bedroom we're going to see now, which I think is the north bedroom, and to the left was that middle bedroom, is what you guys just saw in the pictures there. Okay, so here's exhibit 217. What are we looking at here? Yep, so just kind of a, uh, a shot of the overall bedroom on the right, um, which is also the shooter's bedroom, second bedroom. 218, same north bedroom, but from a different angle? Correct. That would be right when you walk into your immediate left. There's a TV stand, a TV, uh, some clothing on the floor, and on your right there you can see the bed, which had uh, various things spread all over it. Okay. Again, this is the natural state of how you found it? Correct. 219, what are we looking at here? Yep, so that would be you'd walk in, you make a left. At this point, they're kind of rounding the bed. I'm sorry, 282, I misspoke. It would just be the picture of the... Uh, of the bed, and then on the, in the far left corner there is a litter box, cat litter box on the ground there. It's the far left corner? Yeah, so you get right there, yeah. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, just various clothing and other items on the bed. Uh, 219, are we still in the north bedroom? Correct, it's the closet, uh, closing the closet. All right, 220, what is this? It's just the bed, uh, again, various things on the bed. Um, this is 247. Yeah, so that was a notebook that was recovered in the bedroom. Um, obviously, it has some pictures of a rifle on it. Um, looks like another handgun in the bottom left there. Okay, and that's uh, 247. That was found on the bed in the north bedroom? Yeah, correct. Uh, here's 221. Are we still in the north bedroom? Yeah, so that's just, now you're like looking out towards the bedroom. That's the, that doorway to the far left is the door that leads you out of the bedroom. And that open door was the open door to the bedroom that we saw the initial pictures in. Just straight directly across the hall. They were both the shooter's bedrooms. Okay, did you observe anything on the shelf? <laughs> yeah, there were some uh, knives, various knives on the shelves. Okay, and that's depicted in Exhibit 248? Correct. And then finally, Exhibit 222, this is... Standing in the north bedroom, looking down at the, at the TV with me? Yeah, it was the, the TV stand. It had a little fireplace there and various items on the TV stand. Okay, so we, we mentioned the bathroom that was adjacent to these two bedrooms. This is exhibit 223. Does this accurately depict what you observed that day? Yep, it does. Now, did you also participate in the search of the master bedroom? I did. Okay, you mentioned what you observed during that... Um, process when you secured the home, mm -hmm. but you participate in the search as well? Mm -hmm. Correct. This is exhibit 224. What do we see here? 
Yes, yeah, so you'd walk into the master bedroom, which you'll see other pictures here, but to your immediate right, the master bedroom was the bed. Um, and right when you walked in, I mean, this was the first thing you could see was the open gun box. Um, and that box next to it is an empty box of uh, nine millimeter ammunition. And this is exactly how we, we saw it when we did the initial search of the house. And then when we came back in, once the search warrant was granted, this is, this is how it was when we came in. Okay. And this box right here is the uh, empty box of ammunition, the red box? Correct, nine millimeter ammunition. <laughs> This is exhibit 225. This is the same master bedroom. Yeah, just kind of a different view, but that's uh, that view you make a right in the bedroom. The bed was against the wall, and that was one of the sides of the bedroom. Exhibit 226. Yep, yeah, same thing, just the other side of the bed. So that that far window right there on the left would be the window that would face the backyard of the residence. Exhibit 227. Yep, yeah, far left side of the bed there. Um, that's the outer window that faces the backyard, and it's just clothing on the ground. Okay, 228, this is still in the master bedroom? Yep, so that's the door there to the master bedroom. Um, when you walked in immediately on this the This is right, the door here? Correct. Yep. Okay. And on the wall there was an uh, armoire. Um, on the far, or on the immediate right was that armoire. Okay. And this is exhibit 229? Yep, just a different shot. That's the door, immediate right to that armoire. Um, to your left, and that picture's the bed. Okay, just so we're clear, all of these pictures of the master bedroom were taken November the 30th before the room was searched. Correct. Now, was the TV stand searched as well? It was. Okay. And that's where James told you to look for the 22 caliber firearms? Correct. Uh, exhibit 230, this is the TV stand I'm referring to? Yep, so that was what James had described when I spoke with him. Um, that's the TV stand, right? When you walk into the bedroom uh, to your immediate left was that TV stand, multiple drawers, had a TV on it. Um, and then the door you're seeing, there was like a sliding glass door that would lead you to the outside backyard of the residence. This is exhibit 231, this is a straight on view? Correct. Exhibit 233, this is angle to the left? Correct. All right, 234, what are we looking at here? Yep, so um, that TV stand we just saw, the furthest right door that was opened up, and that was where the, uh, the gun box was, or the gun safe was located right there on the top shelf, as it is in the picture there. Okay. And that was um, recovered by you? It was. Okay. And did you use the code 000 to open it? I did. It wouldn't open with that? It did. Okay. Was ammunition found? On that shelf as well? Yep, so when you when the uh, gun box was removed from there, there was uh, two magazines, the holster. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see there. Uh, there's a box of uh, ammunition there in the back. Okay. You say holster. What well, we're looking at, the object on the right, that's the holster? Yeah, it's like a cloth holster, okay. black cloth holster. This is exhibit 235. 236, were those items from that right um, drawer? taken out and put on top of the TV stand? Yep, so at this point they were removed from the picture you just saw. They were put on top of the TV stand. On the left there you can see the two magazines, gun magazines up, and then there's the bag bag with the uh, ammunition in it. And then I think on the right there's the box for the ammunition. Okay, and that's 22 caliber ammunition? Correct. Okay, did you participate in the search of the kitchen as well? I did. First of all, here's 237. This is what, so at, let me ask you, what did you, what is this picture? Yep, so the um, black firearm there is a 22 uh, Caltech handgun that was recovered when I opened the safe. Uh, the, the silver uh, gun there is a 22 Derringer. It's a single shot gun that was also found in the, uh, in the safe once I opened it up. And then there was a, another uh, magazine there in the far left, which is kind of hard to see. And then there's some uh, ear protection. The orange ear protection is also located in the safe when it was opened. So this is 238, what is this? That's the uh, 22 Derringer that was recovered in the safe. And 240. Yep, that's the 22 uh, Caltech handgun that was recovered in the safe. Okay, so this is 276. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? Yep, so that would be the kitchen, uh, the pictures you saw earlier. Uh, that, that would have been on the right-hand side, and we saw the pictures of the kitchen. It's the refrigerator. Okay, so I'm going to try to take us around the kitchen. Is it, well, first of all, is there an island in the kitchen? Yeah, so um, when you're looking outside of the kitchen, there was an island in the middle. Uh, there was across from that was like a sink, some shelving units, and then acro all across from the island is this, which is the fridge, more shelving units, um, all located in the kitchen. Okay. This is 278, so this would be on the other side of the kitchen? 
Yep, correct. So that would just be, and I described the other side of the island, you have the sink there in the left, uh, the stove, um, and just various cabinets and other okay. things in the kitchen there. Did you have keys and search in this island here? I did. Okay. This is 277, that's the island I'm referring to? Correct. All right. Exhibit 253. Tell us what we're looking at here and where it was found. Yep, so on the far right corner there, you can see a black, uh, which is later discovered to be a black gun box there in the far right corner. Let me back up for one second. So we're talking about, I'm sorry, this cupboard here, the right cupboard? Of that I believe it was, yes, the right okay. cupboard, correct. And that's 277. Here's 253? Correct. Yep, so there in the far right corner, you can kind of see that black uh, gun box was located there in the island on the right side of the island. Okay, and was that, was that removed? It was. Okay. This exhibit 255, what is this? Yep, so that's just the uh, the gun box was taken out of there. And, uh, that's just the picture of the gun box. It was the gun box for that Caltech, that black uh, firearm that was found in the bedroom. This is the gun box for that 22 handgun. Okay. And this is 256. What are we looking at here? Yep, so the gun box was opened. Uh, there was obviously empty besides that. Uh, cable lock was located inside of the... Gun box. Uh, if you look closely, you can see the keys to the gun or to the cable lock there in the bottom part of the baggie there. Um, yeah, and that's how that was located when it was opened up. Did you or any other detective find any other locking mechanism for a fire anywhere in the home? No. You want to say was the other gun box next to the blender? What kind of gun box was that? That was for the uh, the twenty two Caltech. Okay. It was the black handgun that was found in the safe in the bedroom. Okay. All right. Okay. And that's in Exhibit two hundred and fifty three, which is also depicted in Exhibit two hundred fifty five, and that's where the cable lock was contained, depicted in Exhibit two hundred fifty six. Is that right? Correct. Okay. All right. Um, all right, what are we looking at here in 257? That's just a gaming system. I believe it was a PlayStation uh, gaming system that was located in the residence. Okay, 258. Yeah, those are um, games for that uh, gaming system, Battlefield, uh, Assassin's Creed, Battlefront, um, just various games that were located inside of the residence for that gaming system. All right, here's 259. Yep, looks like those are more games, Grand Theft Auto. Um, I'm not familiar with the other ones, Battlefield, and then a few to work right there. Okay, 260. Yeah, Call of Duty, um, Attack of on Titan, some other games that would be used in that gaming system. All right, was anything searched outside the home? Yeah, so outside of the house, there was a vehicle, a great Kia, that was located in the driveway. Uh, it's Mr. Crumley's vehicle. Uh, this is a picture of the, when the trunk was opened up, what was in the back of the vehicle. Were there any, uh, was there a garage or a shed associated with the home? Yeah, no garage. So um, the first picture we saw was the outside of the house. There was a, or a driveway to the left of that that led to the backyard. And then in the backyard, there was a shed in the backyard, but there was no enclosed garage or anything like that. Okay, was the shed searched as well? The shed was searched, correct. All right, here's exhibit 298. Before we get to the shed, what are we looking at here? Yeah, it's just like an overhang, like almost like a foyer outdoor area that was covered. Um, there's a grill out there, with like a seating area, which is on the back of the residence prior to getting to the shed. Okay. Here's exhibit 299, is the shed you refer to? Correct. Right. Exhibit 264, what are we seeing here? Yeah, so when you walked into the shed, immediate, immediately through the door to the right, there was a uh, a couple uh, BB guns right leaned against the wall there. As you can see, the one, the brown one to the far left of the picture, and then the black one, which is rested against kind of the door frame there. Okay. You see it's 265? Yeah, just a different angle. Uh, you can see the, the black BB gun in the right corner, then the brown one's right there, visible, leaning against the wall. You see the 266? This, this is like on the workbench in the uh, shed there. Um, there was some BB guns recovered. That's like a Easy style uh, BB gun that was sitting on the bench when we went inside of the shed. Exhibit 267. Another BB gun, it's uh, like a 357 BB gun that was uh, seated on. Same thing, right by the Uzi there, right? we walked in, there was a big, a big bench, and that was on the bench when you walked into the shed. Okay, here's Exhibit 268. Yep, yeah, so you can kind of see the uh, work area there in the back where the BB guns were recovered. This is just kind of an outer shot of some of the chairs and the in the floor of the shed. Uh, 269, where are we looking at here? 
Yep, so that was outside of the shed. It was various uh, CO2 containers which are used to shoot BB guns, pellet guns on the ground there. Okay. Now, back in the home, Exhibit 289, where was this taken? Yeah, so when you, as I described, when you walk in the hallway to before the master bedroom, there was like a landing that led you to the basement and to the outside of the house. So this was just an outer picture of that landing area. Uh, to the left of that photo would take you to the basement, and to the right would take you to the, to the backyard. Okay. And Exhibit 295? Yeah, same thing. Just kind of a landing, just an outer picture of that. Once you go there, the right was that door that leads you to the backyard. And if you went down and made a left, that would take you down to the basement area of the house. Any areas of the home that were not photographed during the execution of the search warrant? No, everything was photographed. Okay. Now, we heard the video where you told James that he and his wife could leave. That was timestamp at 3.42 p.m. At some point, did they return? Yep, so um, after we were done with the search warrant, they returned to the residence, and uh, yeah, they spoke with Lieutenant Mars Band. I was okay. there for that. Were there phone seeds at that point? They were. Okay. And at some point, were they turned over to Oakland County Computer Crimes? Yeah, they were driven back to the high school by myself and Detective McPherson, and they were given to uh, Detective Lebrowski. Nothing further. Thank you. Cross. Yes, Your Honor. One moment. Good morning. Good morning. Can we take you back just to the beginning of your direct? In exhibit, oh, this is gonna log on. In exhibit um, 205, there we, go. there we go. Exhibit 205 is the map that was drawn. Excuse me. The map that was drawn of the Crumbly residence. Correct. And this is of the interior of the residence. You agree? Correct. Now, you also looked at the exterior of the residence because you went in the shed in the backyard, correct? Correct. <clears throat> and if you recall, it's a fairly deep lot. Yeah, it's got a large backyard. Okay, so what you see from the street, the house is closer to the street than closer to the back of the lot. Would that be fair? That's fair. Okay. So, it's not like a, a small backyard. It's, it's fairly deep, which means that there's a, a lot of space between the back of the backyard and the front of the house. Is that fair? Yeah, so there was a fairly large fenced-in backyard. Um, I don't know exactly how big, but yeah, I mean, it was it was large. There, there was a lot of space. Thank you. <clears throat> when you first went into the home, you, you did the initial sweep to make sure that there were no other people in the house, correct? Correct. And, and that's common. That's common practice for executing a search warrant or securing a premises. Correct. And in the home, you noticed that there was an open Sig Sauer box with an empty box of 9mm ammunition in the master bedroom on the bed. Yeah, correct. That was one of the first things I saw when I walked in the bedroom. In the master bedroom, you identified as James Crumpley's bedroom. Correct. And we'll look at, if you need to, we can look at the photo. But do you recall that that, that box of ammunition was Patriot Defense 9mm ammunition? That sounds correct. Okay. We looked at Exhibit 300, which was the first video from approximately 2.50 p.m. in the back of the patrol car. Do you recall reviewing that video? I do. You would agree that as James's wife is being placed in the patrol car with handcuffs, James is obviously distraught. He's asking questions like, why are you in handcuffs? Why is she in handcuffs? Correct? I'm going to object to the form of the question of obviously distraught. I don't think he's able to give that sort of testimony. Uh, um, were you able to observe his demeanor? Yeah, I mean, he was obviously wondering what was going on, asking questions. Um, yeah. He was upset. And I don't really know him. I mean, he was asking a lot of questions. Um, yeah. Trying to figure out what was going on. Correct. You watched the video more, and you reviewed that prior that video prior to coming in today, correct? The in car video. Yes, the uh, exhibit three hundred. I've seen the video before. Okay. Correct. And the reason I'm asking that is because you wouldn't have seen this exchange unless you reviewed the video, which is why I'm asking. But there was a point in the video where James leans over to his wife and tells her he loves her. Do you remember seeing that? Correct. And if you recall, he comments, just in case anything happens, I love you, and he gives her a kiss. Correct. So you would agree that James had some concern that something bad might happen. I believe at some point he states somewhere along the lines of that, so yeah, correct. You said after that Exhibit 300 video, 
James was transported to the substation to be interviewed by law enforcement, correct? Yeah, like I said, there was a lot going on. Initially, we were we were instructed to talk to him, and then after speaking with Sergeant Bryant, it was determined that he had already spoke with them, so he was brought back at that point. Right. So either on the way or once you got to the substation, you learned that, that James had already spoken to Sergeant Bryant prior to you all arriving at his residence, and so you took him back to the residence. Correct. Exhibit 204 is at approximately 3.42 p.m. Oh, let me go back to Exhibit 300. There was a point in that video where... James makes the comment to his wife about um, not talking without a lawyer. Do you remember seeing that? Correct. Okay. Now, you know that if somebody is being suspected of a crime, you've been a detective for a while. Is that fair? Fair. Okay. You know that if somebody's being suspected of a crime or suspected of doing something wrong, that they have the right to counsel. Correct. Asking for a lawyer or wanting a lawyer doesn't mean anything other than I want a lawyer with me. Is that fair? Fair. Okay. Exhibit 204 is after that initial video with James and his wife in the back of the patrol car. You agree with that? Um, is that the, uh, the video where I was speaking with him? Yes, at 3.42 p.m. Correct. At that point, you're waiting for the search warrant to be signed by the court. I am. And you talk to James, and you have a, a, a couple of, of exchanges, and then you ask him if he's willing to tell you where the firearms are, correct? Yeah, I kind of explained him that he could sit in the car, he could go sit in his car, um, didn't have to say where he was when he was talking to me. And then after that, yeah, we had the exchange about where the weapons were in the house. And he used the word absolutely mm. if he would be willing to tell you where those firearms were, correct? Yeah, he was cooperating when I was speaking with him. He told you that they were in a gun case? Correct. That was locked? Correct. That it was in the back of the house, the room in the back of the house? Correct. In the TV stand? Correct. He told you that it was the right cabinet door? Correct. That the gun safe contained a 22 Danger and a 22 Caltech? Correct. And then he gave you the combination, but we would agree that he actually added a digit to the combination. Yeah, he told me there was four zeros, and it actually there was three zeros to get inside the safe. And it's obvious by looking at the gun case, or I'm sorry, the gun safe, that there's only three numbers on it, right? Yeah, the dial has three numbers on it. So you couldn't have added a fourth number. Correct. You would agree that there was a lot going on at that moment. There was a lot going on at that moment for both you and also Mr. Crumbly. Correct. Through your involvement in this case, you're not aware um, whether you're not aware that anyone else in the house had knowledge of that combination. Is that fair? You don't know if anyone else had it. Yeah, I, I don't know. And James also made comments to you about being completely open and wants you to do whatever you have to do. Is that correct? Correct. And you said he was cooperative with you. When I spoke with him, he was yes. In fact, he even commented and told you about that um, that rifle looking BB gun that was in his son's room and, and wanted to assure you that it, it wasn't what it looked like. Yeah, he told me before going in the house that there was going to be that um, rifle that was a BB gun sitting in the shooter's bedroom, correct? There was some exchange and it sounded like like James was going to leave the premises with his wife but said that he needed his phone back. At that point, you all had taken his phone. If you recall. Yeah, so I, did, I at that point did not have his phones, and I, I honestly don't know who had the phones at that point, so I, I don't recall. You knew at that point that he didn't have his phone, based on his statement to you? Yeah, I knew that at that point his phone was not on his person. And we'll get back to that in a minute, because you did talk about that a little bit more. In Exhibit 215, which is a photo of, I believe the, I think we call it the north bedroom, I'm sorry, the middle bedroom. There, you commented that there's a knife on the bed. It was a butter knife, correct? Yes, correct. Exhibit 244, which is also in the middle bedroom, is a photo of the open desk drawer. And there's a notebook, color pencils, and miscellaneous, miscellaneous items. Correct. You didn't open that notebook to see what was in it, correct? I personally did not. No. You don't know if Mr. Crumbly knew what was in that notebook, is that correct? I wouldn't be able to say. Well, you would have no way of knowing, yeah, is that right? I, I don't know. Yeah. Exhibit 245 um, is a picture of the bed. I'm sorry, it's a picture of another notebook in the desk. It's a, a green notebook, correct? Correct. Same questions. You didn't open that notebook. I personally did not open that notebook. You don't know what's in it? I do not know. Um, you don't know? You have no knowledge whether Mr. Crumbly knew? I wouldn't be able to say one way or another. 246. Um, it's a photo of an empty bottle of Canada House whiskey next to the bed. Correct. You don't know how that bottle got there? That was there when we came in the house. Right. 
you have no knowledge of, of how it got there, who had it, who put it there, you have no idea, you just know that it was there. Correct. Exhibit 220 is uh, a picture, I believe, also of the, maybe the, this is the second bedroom, so I believe this is the north bedroom. Um, exhibit 220 is a picture of the bed, mm -hmm. and that would be, is that a yes? Yes. Okay. And that would be uh, Mr. Crumpley's son's second bedroom. That's what it's been referred to, correct? Correct. Exhibit 240, I believe it's 247, I can't read my own writing, is a, a notebook that's open on the bed. You recall seeing that photo? Correct. And inside that notebook, there are photos of gun drawings. Correct. That notebook from 247, if you recall, is the same notebook from 220. If you'd like to see the photos, I can I can. Yeah, so in all honesty, I didn't have a ton to do with those notebooks. Um, I re recall seeing those in there. I don't know where that one came from. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. If you recall from Exhibit 220, the notebook is closed or, or not displayed open and it's under some items on the bed, if you recall. Correct. Okay. Okay. So you didn't open that notebook, you didn't go through that notebook, you have no knowledge of what was in that notebook other than what's in the photo. Yeah, I didn't personally that, at that time go through the notebook. And again, through your involvement in this case, you, you have no knowledge whether Mr. Crumbly was aware of what was in any of those notebooks. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. And Exhibit 235 is the, that is the gun safe, or I'm sorry, that is after you've removed the gun safe from the TV stand in the cover. Uh, yeah, I saw a lot of, can, I don't know what picture you're referring to, I'm sorry. I yes, let me see if I can find it. Are you, are you referring to the one that was recovered in the kitchen? No, this is the actual gun safe that was recovered in the, the actually, bedroom. you know what, let me do it this way. I yeah, have a hard copy of it. Okay. It'll be easier for me to get to. May I approach your honor? Sure. Thank you. I might also ask about 236, so I'm going to bring the both to you. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah, so 235 is the picture of the the, the master bedroom. It's the dresser that where the gun safe is recovered from. At this point, the gun safe had been removed. And all of this that you're seeing in the magazines, the uh, gun holster and the bullets in the background were below that safe that we took out from there. And those magazines, the two magazines, those were empty. They were. When you say below, they were underneath on the lower shelf. Yep, no, so the, the gun safe is recovered on, excuse me, on top of all that. Oh, so at this okay. point, this picture is showing once the gun safe had been taken out, mm -hmm. yep, and that's below that. And 236, if you could look at 236, that's a picture of the magazines and the ammunition that was removed from that cupboard, correct? Yeah, so at this point, everything was taken out and photographed on top of that TV stand there. It's the two, it's the two magazines, the, mag, or the bullets inside of the bag, even the box that the ammunition was, was in. And the, I just wanted to confirm that those were the same magazines that were inside the cabinet. Yeah, correct. So those were empty? They were empty. May I approach your honor? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Detective. Thanks. When you were discussing Exhibit 256 with the prosecution, the prosecutor specifically asked you if there were no other locking me mechanisms found in the home. Do you remember that question? I do. You arrived at the home after, if you recall, after 2 p.m. on November 30th of 2021. Yeah, it was short. It was around the time of the first video we saw. I don't know the exact time, but around the first time of the video we saw the first mm -hmm. video. So it's fair to say you have no knowledge of what was in that house prior to your arrival at approximately 2.50 on November 30th of 2021. Yeah, I can only speak to what I saw when I went inside the residence. I don't know what was there prior. You can't say whether or not there were any additional locking mechanisms in the house that morning. Is that fair? You have no knowledge of that. Again, yeah, I can only speak to what I saw and what I found. I, I don't know what was there prior. Exhibit 260, you went through some photos of video games. 257 was some video game, um, the gaming system. 258 were video games. 259 was more video games. 260... If you recall, and I can I can hand you the exhibit if you'd like, was Call of Duty and a game that you weren't familiar with, Attack of Titan, Attack on Titan. Correct. Did you need to look at that exhibit? No, I. Okay. 
Call of Duty, you saw, based on your testimony, it sounded like you were a little familiar with Call of Duty. Yeah, I, I don't play video games, but obviously I'm familiar just with seeing commercials and I'm aware of what Call of Duty is. Okay. And on the front, of, on, the, on the cover, it has WW2 for World War II, is that correct? Correct. Call of Duty, you would agree, is a, is a military, a type of military video game. Correct. It's a, what would be described as a first person shooter uh, video game. Correct. And if you know, and if you don't, please tell me you don't know. A person playing Call of Duty is a, a, a person holding a firearm in the video game and engaging in combat. If you know. I, I, honestly, I, I, I'm probably the last person to test about video games. I don't play video games. Um, I, I, I don't know. But to your knowledge, it is a military video game, which is a first-person shooter military video game. Correct. At the end of your direct testimony, you discussed that the prosecutor asked you if James Crumbly's phone was seized. Correct? Correct. Now, there are a couple of different ways that law enforcement can obtain somebody's cell phone. Would you agree with that? Correct. You can get a, a, a search warrant and take it from them, right? Correct. They can hand it to you, right? Correct. Um, you can say something like, you can give it to me or we'll get a search warrant, and they can hand it to you, right? Correct. In this case, if you recall, at some point, Mr. Crumley did not have his cell phone because he said, I need to get my cell phone back, correct? While in the back of a patrol car. Correct. At some point, he got his cell phone back. I, I, don't, I didn't have any exchange with him after that about the cell phones. Honestly, I don't know okay. if he got it back. Now, do you recall that... And if you're not aware, just let me know. Are you aware that there was some conversation about James and his wife giving their phones to law enforcement and then having to obtain some sort of another phone to be able to communicate with their family? Yeah, so at some point, uh, Lieutenant Marsband showed up at 112 East Street and um, he had a conversation with uh, James and Jennifer about the cell phones. I don't know the specific language of the search warrant, but um, the phones were given to Marsband, who then he provided to me and my partner, and we took them back to the high school. And if you recall, there was also some discussion about how James and Jennifer could obtain kind of a temporary phone so that they would be able to communicate with people while law enforcement had their phones, if you recall. Yeah, that was a conversation I had with Lieutenant Marsband. Uh, I don't remember the specifics of the conversation, but I know they did have a conversation about the phones. Okay, so you just know that there was a conversation that occurred where it was discussed with James and Jennifer how to obtain like a temporary phone, like a, a track phone or something like that. I don't know the specifics of the conversation. I just know that they did have a conversation about it. Okay, thank you. No further questions, John. Okay. Just quickly, thank you. Uh, Detective, did James ever once tell you that the six hour nine millimeter used to commit the Oxford High School shooting was ever locked up? He did not. Okay. Nothing further. Who's the next one? Can I check on the hallway very briefly, Judge? Yeah, can you give me a student of the link? Can you give me a break? Okay. Okay. Is it long? Long, short? He's a shorter witness, but I think we're signaling to need a break. What, do you want a break? Okay, 10 minutes. Okay. All right, all right for the jury.
Next witness is David Henry. David Hendrick, D A V I D H E N D R I C K. Go ahead, Mr. Please. Thank you. Sir, how are you employed? Uh, as a part time employee with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. Okay, and how long have you been part time? Two days. All right. <laughs> and prior to that part time employment, did you work full time with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office? I did. Okay, and how long did you spend as a full time employee? 34 years. And at some point, did you retire from full-time employment? I did. When was that? Uh, last May. Okay. So you didn't stay retired for long? No. All right. In your 34 years working with the Sheriff's Office, could you tell us, please, what sort of assignments you had? Uh, my last assignment uh, that I had prior to retiring was the uh, Sergeant of the Fugitive Apprehension Team. Uh, prior to that, I worked about 10 and a half years in our Special Investigations Unit. Uh, prior to that, I worked in our Auto Theft Unit. Uh, all those were as sergeants. Okay. Uh, prior to getting to promote a sergeant, I worked in our auto theft unit as a deputy uh, and at one of the substations as a uh, substation detective for a few years. Okay. The special investigative unit, that's what Detective Lieutenant Tim Willis heads up right now. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you specifically about your time with the Fugitive Apprehension Team. First of all, tell us what exactly that is. It's a team consists of uh, a sergeant and seven detectives. 
who are responsible for locating people with felony warrants or who are wanted uh, for serious crimes that they have uh, been alleged to have committed. Uh, those requests that come in are either from our substations at the sheriff's office or uh, other agencies throughout the county that request our assistance. Okay, and forgive me if I've asked this, but how long did you spend with the fugitive apprehension team? Uh, about six and a half years. Okay, and that was as the sergeant? Yes, sir. So you would be the individual leading the team? That's correct. Right. And how many members of the fugitive apprehension team were there? I had seven plus myself. Okay. Is that the role that you had in November and December of 2021? It is. Is it fair to say that all of the individuals on the fugitive apprehension team work as a group? Yes. Now, I want to direct your attention to the days after the Oxford High School shooting of November the 30th, 2021. Uh, first of all, do you remember that day? I do. Okay. Were you working that day and that week? Uh, not that specific day. I was out of town, but the rest of the week, yes. Okay. At some point, were you requested to locate James and Jennifer Crumpton? We were. Can you tell us how that happened, please? I believe it was December 2nd. Uh, Lieutenant Willis asked me to attempt to locate both of them. Okay. And if I told you they were formally charged on Friday, December 3rd, does that sound right? Yes. Okay. So Detective uh, um, Willis sitting at the table here asked you to locate them? Yes. What information did you have at your disposal when you were given this assignment? Their basic information. Their uh, pictures, full names, height, weight, their addresses, vehicles they drove things of that nature. Okay. Were you made aware that their phones were seized on the evening of November the 30th? Yes. Okay, so tell us please what did you and your team do to attempt to locate the defendant? Uh, we began looking at uh, and conducting surveillance at their residence. Um, any family members that we knew of, friends, things of that nature, checked uh, area hotels, places that we might think they might go. Okay. It, did you locate them, you were given this assignment on December the 2nd, you said? Yes. Did you locate them then, that day? We did not. Were you able to identify where they were had stayed from November the 30th until that point in time? Uh, we had identified a hotel they had stayed at. I don't specifically remember the, the name of the hotel, but okay. any hotel. That's fine. Um, when you received that information, what did you do? We... Uh, Checked with the, the hotel staff to find out whether there were still guests there, whether they had checked out, and in fact they had checked out. Okay. So after you learned that they had checked out from that hotel, what happened next? We continued to check area hotels, uh, surveillance of any known locations, and eventually we located a vehicle that belonged to them at a hotel in Auburn Hills. Okay. And when you identified this vehicle belonging to either James or Jennifer Crumbly, what happened next? We can, we, I pulled all of the team to that location and we began uh, constant surveillance on that vehicle uh, to check and see if they would come back for it. Was that on Thursday, December the 2nd or Friday, December the 3rd? That was on Friday, December the 3rd. Okay. And did either the defendant or his wife come back to the vehicle? They did not. Right. And tell us, please, what's happening at that point in time? Uh, at that point, we're still we're still trying to locate them. We're still uh, again checking anything, um, social media, anything we can find to, to try to locate them. Okay. And were you able to at that point? No, we did not. All right. Tell us what happened next. Uh, at some point late in the evening, and I don't remember the exact time we were made aware that their other vehicle had been located in a parking lot by the Detroit Police Department. Okay, so this is late in the evening on Friday, December the 3rd? Correct. Okay. Did you come to learn that they were formally charged at noon on December the 3rd? Yes. Okay, so earlier that same day? Correct. All right. Um, when you learned that, that they were charged, what did you do personally? Myself and one of the other detectives uh, went to what we learned was their attorney's office and checked the office parking lot or surrounding parking lots to see if their vehicle might be there. By chance, they would be in the office with the attorney. Uh, upon not finding the vehicle, 
Uh, we went in and made contact with one of their attorneys. Okay. Um, and without telling us what was said in that conversation, um, did you find other James or Jennifer Crumley there? Did not. Okay. And at that point in time, they had the same attorney. Is that correct? It's my understanding, yes. Okay. And so that was, would that have been before noon on December the 3rd or after noon, December the 3rd? It was after noon. Okay, so after they were charged? Yes. All right. Um, and I'm backing us up a little, a little bit in the timeline. It was after that that the, the vehicle belonging to one of the defendants was recovered? Yes, several hours later. Several hours later. Okay, thank you. Um, later that evening, Friday, December 3rd, what did you learn? That the vehicle was located in the parking lot in the business in Detroit. Okay, so uh, another vehicle belonging to either James or Jennifer Crumley was located in Detroit? Right. All right. Tell us what happened next. At that point, I left one person sitting on the vehicle in Auburn Hills, just by chance they came back to it, and the rest of the team and myself went to Detroit to uh, attempt to locate them somewhere in the area of the vehicle. Okay. The law enforcement personnel involved in this endeavor, was it contained to just the seven of you? No, sir. Okay. Tell us what you encountered when you went to the location where the vehicle was found. Uh, originally, when we got there, there were several Detroit police officers that had the street blocked um, and had the car secured in the parking lot. Uh, as we searched the area, because we had no idea whether they had walked away from the car, they were in the building, we didn't know at that point. So we were searching the area. More and more law enforcement officers arrived. Officers from the U.S. Marshals arrived to assist us, the Border Patrol, uh, the Michigan State Police, more Detroit Police, all arrived on scene. Okay. After the exterior of the location was, was searched, and I take it no one was found then? Correct. Okay. What happened next? We formulated a plan to begin searching the building. It was a three-story industrial building. We had several officers on site, so at that point we decided to begin going room to room and search the entire building. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been admitted as People's Exhibit 307. This is a photograph, sir. Do you recognize what's in this photograph? I do. And tell us how. That is the industrial building where the uh, vehicle was located in the parking lot. Okay. So the parking lot would be behind this chain link fence to yes. the right of the photograph? Correct. Okay. And did you and your team participate in the physical search of the interior of this building? We did. Okay. And now, contained to the interior of the building, again, was it just the seven of you or other law enforcement personnel involved as well? Oh, several law enforcement officers. All right, tell us about that, please. Uh, it, the plan was formulated that the Detroit Police Department would search the first floor of the building. Uh, the rest of the teams that were there, we took on the task of searching the second and third floor of the building. Okay. Now, was this done in secret or was this out in the public, as far as the knowledge? Oh, no, it was it was uh, very obvious, very apparent. Uh, there was dozens and dozens of officers. Uh, we went room to room. Um, at some point, we had obtained keys to some of the rooms. When we had those keys, we were able to unlock the door, announce our presence, go in and search every place in the room that could potentially hide a human being. Uh, other rooms, we did not have keys for, and we were forced to force our way into those rooms. When you say force our way into the rooms, can you describe what that looks like? Yeah, there are, there are several tools uh, that are used to what's called breach or force a door open. Uh, there is a long halligan type pole that a fireman would use. You jam it into the door frame and pry the door back and get the lock to sometimes pop. If that doesn't work, we have a like, 35 pound battering ram, and we will batter uh, the door lock mechanism until the door opens. Okay. Is that a, a quiet endeavor, or is that loud? Well, oh, it's very noisy. Very noisy. So, specific to the three floors in what's the building depicted here in 307, which areas did you and your team search? The second and third floor. Of the okay. And was anybody located in those searches? Not on the second or third floor. Okay. At some point, were you made aware that James and his wife were found on the first floor. Yes. Were you involved in the actual um, breaching of that room and the arrest? No, that was handled by the Detroit uh, 
SWAT team, I believe, handled that door. Okay, and they had already been assigned to the first floor? Yes, sir. Okay. And tell us what happened after that after that occurred. As soon as uh, the SWAT team entered that room and searched it and discovered uh, the Crumleys in that room, they were turned. They were taken into custody by Detroit, and then they were turned over to my team, who took custody of them and transported them back up here to Oakland Town. Okay. Do you recall the approximate time that occurred? Probably 1.30, 1.15, somewhere. It was after 1 o'clock in the morning. In the morning. So we're talking Saturday, December the 4th. Yes, sir. And is James Crumbling in court today? He is. Can you please point to and describe something he's wearing today? Gray suit and headphones. Your Honor, would record reflect the dedication of the defendant? The record will still reflect. Thank you. I have nothing further. Fox? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Your involvement began on December 2nd of 2021, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. You were out of town on November 30th. Is it safe to say you were aware of the shooting that occurred at Oxford High School on November 30th prior yes. to your involvement? Yes. Now, your involvement was as the sergeant of the Fugitive Apprehension Team. Correct. It's also called FAP, is that correct? Correct. <laughs> You testified that, it, that that unit is responsible for locating people with felony warrants or wanted for serious crimes. Correct. Your unit did not get involved in all felony warrant arrests, is that fair? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Sure. All felony warrant arrests in Oakland County, your unit did not go and, and arrest everybody who has a felony warrant, is that fair? That's fair. Okay. And. You didn't, your unit did not get involved with all crimes that people were arrested for. Is that fair? That's fair. And let me clarify. So we know, and we heard some testimony previously, that there was um, a warrant issued by the court, correct? Correct. In this case, correct? And based on your experience, you were a law enforcement officer for 34 years, you were a detective for a number of years, you know that um, somebody who's accused of a crime and charge can, can walk themselves into a court, correct? Correct. With or without an attorney, right? Correct. Um, and that includes for felonies. Correct. Um, their attorney, you're aware that there have been times where their attorney has arranged, sometimes with the detective, sometimes with the prosecutor's office, in various ways, their attorney can arrange for them to be turned in to the court or the police department on a specific day and time. Is that fair? Sure. Okay. Um, the other ways are involving your, your former unit. Correct. Um, and that's done by law enforcement. They, it, the attorneys don't call you up and say, hey, can you come get my client? That's the police who say, go get this person. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously other agencies can get involved with, with our other arrests as well. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. In this situation, your involvement was requested prior to Mr. Crumbly being charged. Yes. You testified that your involvement was December 2nd of 2021. Yes. You were contacted, and I don't know if this was clear, you were contacted by Detective Willis, I'm sorry, Lieutenant Willis. Yes. He contacted you on December 2nd of 2021 and asked you to locate James and Jennifer Crumbly. Yes. Now, did you learn as part of your involvement or as part of getting that initial information that there were some concerns? Well, let me go back. You're aware that after the Oxford High School shooting that people were, were scared. Is that fair? I'm talking people in general. Possibly, I, I would assume. Angry? Sure. Upset? Sure. It was very public what had happened on November 30th of 2021? Yes. The shooter's name became public shortly after the shooting. Yes. If you recall, and you may not know, but if you don't know, please please say you don't know, um, that Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly's residence was made public. That I don't. Did you learn during your involvement in this case that there were some concerns over the safety of James and Jennifer Crumbly because they were the parents of the Oxford High School shooter? I was never made aware of that. So all you were made aware of was that James and Jennifer Crumbly needed to be located? Yes. 
And the first place you went was their residence. Yes. They weren't there. Correct. You eventually determined and learned that they had been at a hotel um, in Auburn Hills from November 30th to December 3rd, the morning of December 3rd. I'm not sure if they were there that entire time, but that's where we ended up finding the vehicle was at that hotel. And did you also learn through your involvement that they registered at that hotel in Jennifer Crumbly's name? I don't specifically remember whose name it was. So you began looking for James and Jennifer Crumbly before they were formally charged? Correct. Now, have you, I assume in your career you've been involved in what would be considered high profile or media cases, is that correct? Yes. And oftentimes in those cases, is it standard practice for your department to take someone into custody before the actual charges are announced? Depends on the crime and the circumstances surrounding it. Um, your department often, and correct me if I'm wrong, but your department will often assume that a high profile case or a serious offense that somebody might run. Uh, it is a possibility, people do. You had no information that James Crumbly had indicated that he was going to run away or flee or anything like that. Is that fair? On December 2nd of 2021. That's fair. You were aware that James and Jennifer Crumbly did not have their phones after November 30th of 2021 because they had been either given to or taken by law enforcement, but law enforcement had them in their possession. Yes. Did you also learn during your early involvement in this case, or at, or at any point, that James and Jennifer Crumbly had obtained um, track phones or pay, pay, pay as you go phones or things like that? Yes. And did you learn during your involvement in this case that those phones were obtained because James and Jennifer wanted to be able to contact family um, in the early days after the shooting? I was not uh, aware of the reason behind obtaining those phones. Did you also learn during your um, during your involvement in this case that James and Jennifer Crumbly obtained uh, additional phones in the same phone number of the phones that were given to law enforcement? I did learn that, but I don't remember at what point in our investigation I learned that. said that charges were formally announced at approximately noon on December 3rd of 2021. That's my understanding, yes. You do not know whether or not James and Jennifer knew that those charges had been formally announced. Is that fair? That's fair. You said that you went to James and Jennifer's attorney's office and you talked to an attorney. I did. That was not me, correct? It was not. Some hours later, you were notified that um, that one of their vehicles was located in a business parking lot in Detroit. Correct. It was not a parking garage, is that fair? Yes. It was not underground parking? No. It was not indoor parking? No. It was in uh, a gated parking lot. We can see the fence in, in the photo, correct? Correct. There weren't boxes or, or branches or anything covering their vehicle. Their vehicle was in the parking lot. Correct. And at some point during your involvement between December 2nd and December 3rd, did you also were you also made aware that that there were going to be some attempts to to do an alternative to what we talked about earlier when it comes to turning somebody in that that um, that Mr. Crumley may be walking himself in to be arraigned on the warrant after he'd been made aware of it. If you recall those conversations. I had I had conversations with an attorney, but I'm not sure what I can go in. Yes, and I'm not asking you about the details of the conversation. Just if you had some knowledge that that there were that there was an indication that Mr. Crumbly was was not running, but that he was in fact going to turn himself in again without giving. Yeah, Judge, I object to this whole line of questioning. I think it's getting close to speculating what the purpose of what a hearsay conversation would be. And it, could open the door to other things. Oh, yeah. Are you going to open the door to that? I can move on, Judge. Right. <clears throat> At no point during your involvement in this case were you told 
James Crumbly is absolutely avoiding these charges and will not be turning himself in. At no point were you told that. There's the same question, same objection to the same question, just asked differently. Well, and who, who is he being told that by? It could be anybody, Your Honor. His, his involvement was requested by Lieutenant Willis. He had multiple police officers involved. There were multiple people involved in, in allegedly, or in locating Mr. Crumbly. I'm just asking if he was ever given knowledge that that, that was going to happen. Just as a, as a response, he's testified to what his job was. He was given an assignment and he carried it out. Well, I don't know. I guess you got to be careful what you wish for, right? Thank you, Judge. Yeah, I you know. You indicated that the building where Mr. Crumbly's vehicle was was a quote-unquote three-story industrial building, as I believe what you called it. Yes. That was Exhibit 307, which is on the screen. In that building, obviously from the outside, it looks kind of like a warehouse. Would you agree with that? Sure. But you learned during your involvement that there were multiple tenants in that building. Yes, multiple suites. Right. Or rooms. Businesses. Yes. Um, people who were regularly in and out of that building. That I can't answer to. It was very late and there was nobody in and out when we were there. Okay. Did you learn during your involvement that there were people in and out during the day that day? Not at the time I was there. Okay. And you may not be the right witness to ask these questions of. I'm just trying to determine what exactly you knew about this building. Yeah, at that point, at that hour of the night, there was nobody coming in and out. And we wouldn't have allowed anybody to come in or out anyway. And you learned in going into the building that there was an option for interior parking. Did you learn that? Um, I don't recall there being any interior parking, like a parking garage, if that's what you mean. Right. Like a way to pull a vehicle in through a garage and park it inside instead of out in the in the lot. There was a loading dock, so I guess technically you could have pulled a car inside of there, okay. but, but I did not see... It was not a designated indoor parking structure. Right. So not like a parking garage or, or those underground parking like we were talking about earlier. Correct. Okay. Your testimony was that it was obvious and apparent what was going on outside of and in that building during your search of the building, correct? Yes. Now, you can't say, because you, you really have no idea what James Crumbly heard or saw that night, correct, on December 3rd of 2021, or the early morning hours of December 4th of 2021. I can only tell you what I saw and heard in the commotion, the law enforcement officers, the, the flashing lights from the police cars, but specifically as to what he saw and heard, I can't tell you. Right. You have no knowledge of whether or not he saw or heard any of that. Is that fair? Yes. You were not part of the arrest of James Crumbly after entry was made by DPD's SRT unit, correct? Correct. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. <clears throat> Sir, who were you given this assignment by? Lieutenant Wilkes. <clears throat> okay. And you were asked to locate James Crumbly on December the 2nd, not arrest him on December the 2nd, is that correct? Correct. And this, that's not uncommon for an officer in charge to contact the fugitive apprehension team to locate a suspect, is it? No, that's not uncommon at all. Okay. And the goal as a member of the fugitive apprehension team is a peaceful surrender? Yes. Okay. Is that why you reached out to Mr. Crumbly's attorneys? Absolutely. Okay. And there were no arrangements made to you to turn the defendant in on Friday, December the 3rd, were there? No. Nothing. All right, you can step down on your excuse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Luke Curley, yes. Curtly. Good morning. Would you uh, raise your right hand? You swear or affirm the testimony you have to give? Is it true? So I'll help you back. Yes. All right, you can be seated. And would you stick your name to the record and spell your first name? Luke Curtly, L U K E K I R T L E Y. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. May I call you Luke? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're just... One moment, we're having a little technical difficulty. Are we all set? Okay. Um, this one is... Oh, there. Okay. 
Luke, can you tell the jury uh, what you do for a living? Sure. Uh, I own a uh, coffee company called Coffee House. Uh, we roast and import coffee here in Detroit. And um, you roast and import, but do you, do you, are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Do you, do you do anything else? With, you have a store, you have, do you sell coffee from yeah, and kind uh, of? Yes, yeah, so we sell to you know about 100 different businesses around Metro Detroit, so uh, coffee, tea, products like that. And then uh, we have our own cafe up at uh, Somerset Mall as well. And where's your business, the, the roasting and importing, where's it located? So the roasting and importing side of things, uh, all the manufacturers done at uh, 1111 Bellevue Street in Detroit. In Detroit. Mm -hmm. And can you tell the jury about what area that is in Detroit? Yes, yeah, so it's in a neighborhood called Island View, which is like mostly industrial buildings. Um, it's basically situated a block off of where Belle Isle is located. So generally East Detroit is kind of the consideration here. Okay. Um, and I want to draw your attention to November 30th of 2021. Uh, was your business at that location at that time? Yes. And we're... Were you residing near or around your, your business? Yeah, at the time I was living, um, I mean, maybe a mile away, pretty close though. Okay, and just let's just take a, a, a moment and can you just, can you tell the jury what this building um, is, how much of the space you occupy and what it's used for? Sure, so um, it's an industrial building that was built in around the 1920s. Originally they built like pickup trucks or something inside of there, but um, now the current owner has it basically for different um, tenants, you know, so we occupy about 3,000 square feet in the building. I'd say there's probably five to ten different tenants who rotate in and out every now and then. Uh, the, the building itself is basically um, split up into like one, one to 2,000 square foot units itself. Um, so at any time, you know, I'd say there's on average ten tenants in that building um, at any given time. So. And are they all um, the same type of of no, 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 all completely different people. Like our neighbors, uh, they like breed rare plants, okay. uh, tons of different stuff. All right. Um, and on the first floor, is that where you are? Yes. Correct. All right. Mm -hmm. Who else is on the first floor, if you know? So there's the rare plant uh, place. And then um, there's uh, somebody who packages like fine art. Um, there is a, there's a painter who... Uh, does just like hobbyist work, and then I think that's it for us on the first floor. I don't know if there was somebody else in there at the time, but I think it was just that four. Okay. How do you enter the? Well, we just heard testimony that they're about parking. Um, our former uh, witness wasn't sure. Can you tell the jury whether there was parking within or outside or um, the the building? Yeah. So you can park in three space or three. I would say designated areas uh, for the building. There's one on one side of the building. There's another on the other side. And both of those entrances are gated, so you have like a little, you know, fob uh, to open the gate, garage opener. Garage Which opener. tenant has a fob? Uh, yeah. Well, they, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say every single one does, but usually, if you ask, um, you know, the property manager can approve that and give you one. Uh, and then people generally park on the street as well. Um, now there's like a, a dirt lot across the street that people park, but at the time of this. Uh, that was not their land, so and three was, general spots. was there indoor parking? Uh, no, there's not designated indoor parking, though um, some tenants have garages. Okay, let me, where let me ask it a different way, because it's it's relevant to what was sure. happening that uh -huh. night. Do you use that building space for anything other than your, just your business? So on the third floor of the building at the time, um, I used our garage storage area to put one of my cars away. All right. Mm -hmm. and. Just briefly, because it, it relates, what, yeah. what's your relationship with cars? Okay, so um, I just... Uh, Your Honor, I, mean, I would object to the relevance. Your Honor, um, yeah, I, I, if I, I could just respond. I um, can I just respond, please? Mm -hmm. uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask him about identifying the car and how he was able to identify that car. Um, I, I think most people wouldn't have been able to, so I'm, I'm just trying to lay a, a foundation. Well, based, based on my knowledge of the previous testimony, I'm, I'm going to allow that. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so I'm just a general car enthusiast. I think I, you know, I've been obsessed with cars ever since I was a kid. And uh, at the time, I had two or three cars, and one of them, uh, I, it was like a nicer one, so I put it away. You know, I didn't leave it on the street where my house was because I had street parking. 
So I had one of my cars that got like hit. You know, the mirror got pulled off, so I obviously didn't want that to happen to a nicer car. So um, on the third floor, we have a garage, and so I pull that in during uh, you know the nighttime or any time I don't plan on enjoying it, driving it. Um, okay. When, so uh, I can drive my all right, thing. thank you. Uh, so is there any <clears throat> need? Was there any vendor vendor type um, businesses in that building? And the reason I ask is, is it a place where customers would come and park and open to the public? Uh, the I, I would say that it's generally not um, like a public building. There's not. Um, present retail in the building. There's not like, for example, our Road Street doesn't have a coffee shop or any cafe component. It's strictly like a you know business okay. um, for manufacturing. And when you switched the car that, that night, do you remember, did you go, and, and were you at the, the warehouse that night at, a, at later in the evening? Yes. Um, do you remember about what time it was? Uh, probably around 10 p.m. And is that something you would routine, routine, routinely do at night because of the, the situation with your cars or Objection, that? Objection, I'm eating. I, I just tried to get out, or so that it wouldn't be a leading question. Why were you there that night? Um, to, to switch the cars. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Uh, so, um, talk to me, or tell the jury, what, if anything, you knew about the, the Oxford shooting or the crumblies that that sure. evening. Yeah, so I was uh, generally aware of obviously the news that had happened. You know, I, I read the news about the shooting, um, which I think everybody in Michigan really kind of heard those heard what had happened at that point. Um, early in the day, I remember seeing a um, a poster about um, you know the parents being on the run. And okay, so, you're you're gesturing your hand, and when you mm -hmm. say poster, um, and for. Do you remember, was that November 30th? Of, of, what, what day was that? I, I assume it was the same day that um, this happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. Earlier well, in the day. let me back up. Sure. The same day that they were charged or the same day that the event happened? The Objection, Your Honor. I, I don't think that there's been testimony that Mr. Kirtley is aware of when they were charged. Okay. I mean, she's trying to, he said, he said the same day that this happened, so she's clarifying if he means the encounter and Bellevue or the, or the shooting. Mm -hmm. The encounter. Oh, okay. Uh, do you remember the actual day that you that this occurred that night? Uh, the 30th of November, I believe. That was the shooting. Yeah. Do you remember uh, the date then, and what date it was? If I said December 3rd, does that make sense to you? It seems it seems correct. I okay. don't know like if I remember it off the top of my head the exact okay. date. Backing up, you were mm -hmm. motioning to your hand and saying poster. And uh -huh. I, I'm, what, what so, uh, I saw it on Facebook. Okay, uh -huh. and what did you see? So it was a poster, um, it was a, essentially like a wanted poster. So there were pictures of, um, you know, the parents, a picture of the car, the license plate was on there, and then um, I think just general information about what had happened. Were you aware that law enforcement <clears throat> was looking for the crumb police? Yes. And uh, do you remember about what time you arrived that, that evening? Uh, around 10 p.m. Okay. And uh, tell the jury what, if anything, you saw when you entered the, the parking space. Is it Well, first of all, mm -hmm. when you go there at that time of day, is there usually anybody in the parking lot? Uh, not really. There's a couple tenants who like leave their cars there. Um, there's like a work van for a mill work company. Um, but generally, there's not like many vehicles that hang out in that lot overnight. Okay. So you drive into the parking lot, and mm -hmm. what do you see? So originally, um, so I drove into, if you're facing the front of the building, uh, I always park on the right side, so there's two lots left, right? Um, and I just have a fob for the right lot. It's two different ones. So I pulled in, um, was just doing my thing. Generally, um, there's some cars there. So, you know, when I saw this car that was backed into the spot in the corner, originally I didn't pay any mind to it. You know, okay, when like, you say this car, what do you mean? So you, sure, drove in, you did see a car? I did see a car, yeah. Okay, can and you so tell the jury was, uh, where it was? Yep, so it's back in the, it was, like if I'm facing the front of the lot, it's a rectangular lot, and it was in the back right corner. Um, so probably the furthest spot from the, the building entrance in theory. And was it backed in with the front out, or was it the other way? It was backed in with the front out. Okay. And what else did you see? Um, so I saw that car there, but originally, you know, didn't pay too much attention to it and then walked into the building. And then when I walked out of the building uh, was when I was really kind of like met face to face with the front of the car. And that's when I remembered, um, you know, the original wanted poster. I saw 
you know, I, being like a car enthusiast, I saw that and it just kind of stuck with me. It was like a newer Kia. So I had just not seen that car in person before. So like when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's a new Kia. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's like that new Kia. You know, so like, you can tell by looking at the, the front of the car it was that it was a new Kia? Yeah, so if you looked at the like poster, it was like that stock image of the car. You know, you see like on websites and everything. It, um, so it's obviously the front of the car. And it was this, I believe it was the same exact color too um, on the poster. So when I saw it, I was like, oh, like I remember where I saw this from. Okay, one moment here. All right. So, what did you what did you do next when you came out and? <laughs> yeah. So um, when I saw the car, I was like, okay, that's. I remember seeing that. I pulled up the poster on my phone, and when I was doing that, I was walking to the back of the car to check the plate because I remember seeing the plate on the actual, um, you know, poster. And so I walked around the car with my flashlight on, uh, and then you know, obviously, it hit me when I saw like the license plate on the ad, and then I was standing in front of the license plate too. Uh, but yeah, so basically I had pulled up um, the wanted po poster and subsequently was walking around the car. And did the license plate car. match? It did. And did you see anything else of significance in the um, back of the car? So when I was looking at the back of the car, um, I had then noticed uh, there was a person sitting next to the car. There's like an elevated curb that kind of sits behind where this car was and it's uh, like protects like a little garden area. And so somebody was sitting on the curb with their hood up. It was like a blue plaid hoodie. And uh, I didn't, you know, when I was walking through the car, I didn't see anybody. And also it was dark. So, you know, I wasn't expecting to see anybody really. I thought it was just like a car at that time. Did you say so, anything or did that individual say anything? No. Um, <laughs> they stayed kind of like turned around uh, with their hood up. I saw them and then I turned my flashlight off and headed back into the building. Okay. What did you do next? Um, so I walked into the building. I quickly, briskly headed into my unit, locked all the doors. Uh, the lights were off at the time, so I kept the lights off and then called 911. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you um, what's been marked as Exhibit 302. And uh, this is the security footage from your building. It, how many cameras, if you know, does the building have? I don't know. It's off the top of my head exactly, but I could tell you there's... Uh, one in like the center lobby area, kind of like the general promenade where most people congregate. Um, there is one on the side of the building, one or two on the side that we're talking about, one on the front, maybe another one on the other side, but I don't like have to memorize. Okay, so um, I'm going to, we're gonna start this at 22.56, which the actual time is 10.34 p.m. And what are we looking at here, Luke? So. Uh, what we're looking at is the parking lot, uh, the parking lot that I am, that I park my car in. And so this is, when I was talking earlier about facing the front of the building and looking backwards, this is um, the furthest from the front of the building. Okay, so. But this is attached to who, the building. Who is that right there? Um, I assume that this is the person that I saw in the blue plaid hoodie. Okay. And in this photo, um, where is the front, the entrance that you would have gone in? So where they just walked out of, so on the okay. right side of the screen. And eventually we're going to see you pull in. Will, will, will we see that at the top of the screen? Yes. Okay. Correct. Is that your car? Uh, I assume so. Uh, I'll know once I see the roof rack on it. Uh, but at time, time checks out. Okay. Do you do you see the the Kia that you spotted in this image? Yeah, uh, on the left side there. Okay, it's kind of hard to see. Okay. Is that your car? Yes. And are you parking right in front of the entrance? Um, I mean, not like directly in front of the door, but you know, one, one of the close spots. parking yes. stops. Okay. Mm -hmm.
party, we see, is, is that individual you yes. at the right of the screen? Mm -hmm. And is that you going back into the building? Yeah. Okay. What's happening there? Um, Did you go out to your car to look at the car? Uh, no, I think that when I just... So I think this is when I just first noticed the car. Like I think I just saw myself look over and just, yeah, it looks okay. like that checks out. I was probably just grabbing something that I had. All right. And seat. that's you right there? Yes. Are you holding anything? Uh, my phone. And for the record, this is around 23.04, which is actually 10.42 p.m. And you're, are you walking at the same pace or a different pace than you? you Maybe, a little, you're under relevance? Maybe a little quicker. I, I, the, I'm, I'm eliciting just general testimony from a fact witness about his, what he observed. Okay. I, I, thank you. Um, so you, why are you walking at a faster pace? Um, Probably to, uh, I mean, probably a lot of emotions going on at that specific time. Okay. Um, you know, I at the time when I first went to the car, I didn't expect to see anybody. So when I did, I was like, okay, I want to get safe inside. Okay, and we're going to play exhibit 303, um, which is the 911 call. Um, and were you feeling any emotions during that call? Uh, yeah, definitely, for sure. Okay. Um, that's... Something that I feel like, well, I've personally never experienced before is like that type of connecting the dots like that. Um, and I hope everybody else doesn't. Okay. It's a lot. All right. Call one. Call on Friday, December 3rd, 2021, 1043 and 14 seconds p.m. This is 911. What is the address of the emergency? 1111 Delby Street. Repeat the address of this station. 
Okay. So yeah, I mean within 30 seconds. All right, and I want to go back to the previous video and finish that um, to show what happened after you went inside. Yes. That's you, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what is that, if you know? Uh, that was the that? person that I saw uh, walking into the building. So, if you ask me at the time, um, that somebody was going to be walking in behind me, I would have told you no way. You know, the building is, there's fobs for every door. Um, but like I said, you know, it's not a public building. And so uh, when the officers came by, they asked me, you know, I was I was like, oh, they, they probably took off somewhere. Um, I would, My confidence in them being inside of the building was, you know, limited. You did I, not I, think they were inside, whoever that correct. was? Yeah, I definitely didn't think that they were right behind me. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, in the call, you stated it, you referred to the individual as female mm -hmm. and she. Yeah. Did you ever see the person's face? No, I didn't. They were turned to their back. I think it was just like generally the, the figure of the person that I saw, um, more or less. Okay. Um, what happened after you called 911? Um, so you can see an officer in the top right. Getting there. So that's pretty quick. Was it a few minutes? Was yeah, a couple minutes. minutes. It, it wasn't too bad, um, especially for Detroit response oh. time. Uh, okay. So the when you come or I came out and I actually met them out there because I saw their lights. Um, if it wasn't the siren, it was like one of their floodlights. And but when I saw you someone. came out of the building, did you know where the individual was? No, okay. I did not. I assumed at the time they probably just took off. All right. Know? I was. Uh, to be honest, I was surprised that the car was still even there. I thought they like. Okay. All right. But. Um, at some point, did more than just one officer arrive? Yeah, so I think it was one or two squad cars that showed up originally, and then so there's the second one right there. Um, so I walked them through the building to get into the parking lot because the parking lot is closed. And I think once they kind of confirmed that the car was correct, uh, that's when uh, a lot more people showed up. What? What's a lot? Ten plus squad cars. All right. Mm -hmm. What? Where did you remain? Well, let me just. At what point was this over to the extent where you went home? How many? Oh, I was there till like two or three. Okay. Mm -hmm. And were you in the building the whole time? No, I was in the building for probably like an hour. Um, I was in my unit, uh, and then they had questions. You know, I was talking with them a little bit, uh, kind of just like generally floating between the front of the building and then inside my office. Um, and then they, I got into a squad car and they put me to what they called like a command post or something like that, um, where it was like a couple blocks away, they had set up like a central command, like HQ for other officers and stuff like that. At some point, did you learn whether or not the individuals were taken in custody? Yeah, uh, like way late in the night. Um, did you did you learn where they were located? Yes, I did. They um, So they actually walked me, like they showed me where it happened and afterwards. Where, where were they located? So the painter that I referenced earlier on in this uh, testimony, we shared basically drywall with them, two pieces of drywall, so they were right in the unit adjacent to where ours is. And that unit, did, is that that's on the first floor, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Correct, yeah. Where, does it have windows in it at all? It does, yeah, uh-huh. And are they facing the parking lot, or are they yeah, facing... Yeah, so the, if you're facing the front of the building, my unit is on the right, it closes the right side of the building, and then there's another unit behind ours that also faces right into the parking lot. So. This unit would have looked um, 
and I say looked, it's not like a clear, perfectly clear window, it's like frosted, but uh, would have looked into the parking lot. All right. Mm -hmm. Did the did the law enforcement that showed up, were they, did, did they have lights and sirens? Were there any lights? Were there any yeah. sounds? Yeah, tons. Um, and, you know, like, we're pretty aware of what goes on, just given, like, the, the thinness of the walls. You know, there's no insulation between our walls. And then, um, you know, especially at night, you're aware of any lights that go down the street. Um, Anything like okay, that. You mentioned the walls and the thin walls. What do you mean? Do you mean you're aware because of noise or because of um, what you see? Yeah, both. Uh, for I mean, for the walls, you know, we hear other units, other people, you know, in the building. Like I know when other people are in the building, um, for sure. And the do you the just to clear your testimony? You know they're in the building uh, because you can hear them, or you know they're in the building because you see them. Uh, are we talking about the officers in general? Or in general? Um, Hold on, just let me finish yeah, my question. Ahead. This wall you share mm -hmm. is what are, is what you're trying to say that you can tell if somebody's in there even if you haven't seen them. Yeah, okay. you can hear them. Okay. I mean, if they're making if they're making noise. Okay. And when you were in the building for that hour, uh, was the building being searched or were the was law enforcement out in the parking lot? Uh, no, the building was being searched at that time. And what did you hear, if anything? Uh, so I was in like the front of the building at the time. Uh, they were, I mean, they were definitely. They, had guns drawn, you know, they were searching the building, they were announcing that they were there. Uh, they were definitely making a presence. Okay. Before this uh, day, um, which was um, in December 3rd, I guess it was December late in the night, but yeah. before this occurred, um, had you ever seen anything discarded or left out in a hallway um, in the building? Oh yeah, so um, in the center promenade that I mentioned earlier about like where the camera is, there's um, people put like, I think, I don't know, people put things to give away there and then also people like store things there for very short periods of time. At the time there was like a new tempur mattress that was there, or new to me, you know, looking new. Um, and it was sitting up against the wall and I was there for a while because somebody had like taped a note to it that was like, can I buy this from you, you know, whoever it was. And how long was it there? Days, weeks? Days, okay. yeah. Uh -huh. And um, why is the mattress significant to you? Um, so, well, so the mattress was um, taken into the unit, and I saw that afterwards. So when, I, uh, when they showed me the unit again, um, you could see that the mattress was then in there. Um, you know, I, I don't really know who actually owned the mattress, okay. even to this day. At some point, did you ever see the mattress again? Yeah, so then people, somebody, I don't know who, but somebody took it back out of the hallway, and I think whoever actually owned it um, didn't want it anymore, because it floated around, like it was sometimes like in front of the unit that they were in, and sometimes in the middle of the hallway, and sometimes like on the floor, like it was, it was a very, um, yeah, it was very agnostic where it was for a while, and then I don't know what happened to it. Okay, all right. Nothing further. Ross? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Good morning. Morning? Morning. So, excuse me, just one moment. So you went to 1111 Bellevue on December 3rd of 2021 at approximately 10 p.m. from what you recall? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, I'm, if you say, mm, I might ask yeah, you to I did say that last yes. Time, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Um, you said that you described 1111 Bellevue as an industrial building that was once used for manufacturing. Yeah, in the 1920s. Right. So, yeah. On December 3rd of 2021, it was not a manufacturing building. Uh, no, there. I mean, there are individuals, tenants who do different types of manufacturing. Like, there's a millwork company. We I technically manufacture coffee, uh, but they're not manufacturing pickup trucks in the way that they were 100 years ago. Right. So in the 20s, it was used as uh, as basically a, a truck factory. As far as I know. Okay. Yeah. But on December 3rd of 2021, it was a business building. Correct, yeah. It was just industrial in style. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, specifically the look of the building. Right, the look of the building was industrial, but it was mm -hmm. not an industrial use building. Uh, I think it's technically zoned industrial still uh, to this day. I don't know if it's zoned mixed use, but I'm not, I'm not fully positive on the um, regulations and codes okay. of buildings. What we agree on is that they're not building pickup trucks, right? Correct. It's not abandoned. Correct. Um, there were multiple tenants in the building. Correct. Um, 
And there had been multiple tenants for quite some time, for what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. At least a couple of years. Okay. Your, where you roast coffee is approximately 3,000 square feet, is that correct? Yeah, so there's 2,000 square feet on the first floor and an additional 1,000 on the third floor. Okay, so the 2,000 square feet on the first floor is the is the space where you share the wall with the artist studio. Yes, correct. And then you have the 1,000 square feet on the floor, which is where you keep your cars. Uh, yeah, at the time, yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. There's also, um, you can drive your car in. In fact, in this video we can see, I think we can see where your car is parked. And you can drive your car in to like a, is there like a garage door or so, something? So not in this. Um, so it's on the front of the building. There's a there's a uh, drive-in garage door. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how people get to their various garages, is that? Uh, yeah, to say, I would say like they're not... There aren't any other garages in the space, but um, that's how people unload and load uh, their cars in there. You said that you were generally aware of the Oxford High School shooting on December, I'm sorry, November 30th of 2021. Yeah. You had seen media reports, I'm sure. Yes. You'd read stuff on social media. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, you said that everyone knew what happened. Yeah. On December, on November 30th of 2021. Correct. Prior to December 3rd of 2021, you saw a poster, uh, a wanted poster, on yes. social media. Mm-hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And you saw it the day, you saw it on December 3rd of 2021. I believe so. And that poster had a photo of James and Jennifer Crumbly? Yes. Or photos of James and Jennifer mm-hmm. Crumbly? Yes. A photo of their vehicles? Yes. A license plate number? Yes. General information about the shooting? Yes. It indicated, I think your testimony was, it indicated that they were on the run. Um, yes, I think it was more of like a be on the lookout or a, a wanted poster generally. There was a reward offer, if you remember? I don't remember at the time. Your testimony was that the Kia, which we can see in the, on the left side of the frame, was parked the farthest from the building entrance. Do you remember that being your testimony? Yes. You also testified that there's actually a door on the right side of the frame in front of where your car is parked. Yes, I would say that um, the main entrance and then the um, ancillary entrances, I'm speaking mostly in regards to the main entrance of the building, which is on the front. Okay, so there are multiple entrances to the building. Mm-hmm, there are, yes, there are three entrances to the building. Okay, so there wasn't just one way to get in on the front of the building, there was also the, the door right where your car is parked. And in fact, yes. we watched you walk into that door. Yes. You said that you walked up to the Kia on the left side of the frame, you walked around to the back, we, we watched you do that, correct? Yes. You confirmed the license plate number from yes. what was on the wanted poster the, on your social media. Yes. And then you saw someone sitting next to the car. Yes. If you recall, that person was smoking? Uh, I, d- I don't recall. I don't. I saw that in other news articles and things like that, um, but I, I did not say that or see that originally. Okay. You said that you didn't expect to see anyone sitting outside the car? Yeah. You expected just to have the car there empty? I think for clarity, I didn't expect to see the car or have the car be uh, a matching car in the first place. So there were a lot of unexpected things happening at that specific time. Uh, but that's about it. You said that you wanted to get safely inside? Yes. You assumed that the person that you saw was dangerous? Uh, yes. That was based on what you had seen on the news and in media reports? Yes. Based on the wanted poster? Yeah. uh, Maybe not particularly, I wouldn't say that like the poster said armed and dangerous or anything like that. Not 100% positive. Um, But I think generally in a situation like that, I would fear for my safety. Based on your own personal beliefs about the Oxford High School shooting and what you had heard in the media about James and Jennifer Crumb. Yes. The person sitting outside the car didn't say anything to you? They did not. They didn't say, hey, look away? No. They didn't say a word, right? There was no interaction between us. In Exhibit 303, you called, was your 911 call, you recall that you told the 911 dispatcher that the parents were on the run? Yes. Um, And again, that was information that you had based on what you'd heard in the news and the media and what you've seen on the wanted poster. The person that you encountered next to the Kia didn't say, hey man, I'm, I'm running away. 
you, you said there was no encounter there at all. There was no interaction. Okay. Now, right around this time timestamp, uh, 2306 on the video, which I believe is about 20 minutes earlier in real time, mm -hmm. um, the prosecutor pointed out that somebody walked across the parking lot after you'd entered the building. Yes. That person didn't run after you, correct? Uh, no. From what you saw in the video? Correct. They didn't chase you down? They did not. Didn't threaten you in any way? They did not. You didn't even know that they were there? Uh, I, I, obviously, I saw them. I didn't know that they followed me in. Correct. You didn't know that they walked in after you'd walked into the building? Correct. I think by the time I was in my unit, um, you know, I didn't hear the door shut. I didn't know if they, like, softly closed the door or anything, but um, I didn't know that they were in it. You had no knowledge that that person had even entered the building? Correct. You then testified that there was about a couple minutes later, we watch, and, and I'll play the video too. I just want to see. We'll play the video too. A couple minutes after this 2306, um, or a couple minutes after you called 911, the police showed up. Correct. So if you look at the timestamp right now, it's 230654. Mm -hmm. And then it jumps to 2321. And then we play it for a little while and we see what, what you believe was a patrol car out there outside the, the fence, correct? Yes. At 2321. Yes. So at that point, it had been just shy of about 20 minutes between you entering the building, at some point making a 911 call, and the police showing up. Uh, from from this, yeah. From this video. Yeah. Okay. I'd say my my conception of time was probably a little skewed in that specific moment, just given the the heightened senses, you know. Yeah, and I'm yeah. not I'm not yeah. asking you to lock into the time number in the couple minutes. I'm asking it actually was not just a couple minutes; it was actually more than a couple minutes. Sure. That's that's all I'm asking. Sure. Okay. Now, I, I I thought I heard you say this a couple of times, but I, I just want to clarify. You said that you were at the building for about an hour after you made your 911 call? Um, more or less. I'm not 100% positive exactly. Then you were driven to um, a temporary, what you call the command post? Yeah. That like law a, enforcement had set up? Yeah, correct. I think there were, you know, there was media there. There was um, the more squad cars. There was like a massive blue bus for the police. And then, and this was the part that I wanted to make sure I heard you say correctly. And then the police took you back to this building and walked you through Well, my the scene. car was there, so I had to get my car. And so um, when I was going through the building to get my car, um, they were, you know, there were a bunch of police in the building, and they were like, oh, this is where they were. And they allowed you to enter the scene? And no, I did not enter the scene. Okay. And that's what I was unclear about, because you, you testified that you had seen the mattress in the unit after James and Jennifer Crumley yeah, were arrested. Yeah, so, so when I walked through the center of the building, you have to turn right um, to exit through the, to access this parking lot that's on the screen. And so to exit that, you have to pass by the door of um, where they were hiding. And so that door was open, so you could see the mattress. Okay. Now, you talked about what you heard while you were in the building. You said that you were at the front of the building while the police were searching the building? Uh, yeah, so I, like I said, I was generally kind of floating around, um, you know, because we have two, I have two doors on my building, or my unit, for example. I have, like, side doors and the front door, and so I was somewhere between those, or I was outside in the front. So you know what you heard and saw, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what you observed on your own? Yes. You have no knowledge of what James Crumbly heard or saw while the police were there? That's correct. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor, just briefly, do people, um, is there any residential um, unit, and, and I guess what I'm asking is, do people sleep at the building? No, it's in, it's within the terms of my lease, at least, um, and generally I think it's one boilerplate lease that goes across all of them, um, though that is an assumption that it is not allowed, uh, you're not allowed to sleep there. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I want to play the, the video just a portion of it quickly. Um, Your testimony was that you never saw the front of this individual? That's right. But 
what the um, the actual piece of clothing. How did you describe it? Uh, in Objection the, order, asking answer. How did you describe it? You said something in the 911 call. I said it was a plaid hoodie. Okay, do you know what color, do you remember what color it was? It, during the 911 call, uh, I didn't say. I think it might have been blue. Okay, but That's you're not sure. Not 100% positive. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to show you another image. Exhibit 304. First of all, is that the art studio, if you know? Uh, yeah, I've never been inside of it, but uh, like I said, when you pass the, to go to the parking lot or leave the parking lot, sometimes the doors open. So I know that there's like paintings in there and I know the general footprint of the okay. space, just given where it is. All right, uh, do you, did you ever see uh, James or Jennifer Crumbly other than? No, okay. only the, the, obviously the seeing somebody next to the car, but when they were arrested and taken away, I wasn't in the building, or I was at the like command post. Okay. Right? Um, and can you describe what that individual is wearing that's not the police officer? Uh, it looks like a blue um, sweatshirt or hoodie of some sort, plaid. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. Your free free cross. Okay. Mr. Curley, to your knowledge, James or Jennifer Crumbly were not tenants of Eleven Eleven Bellevue. Correct? That's correct. You have no idea if they had any knowledge of what the terms of the lease were, correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. No further questions, Your Honor. But they wouldn't have had a fob because they weren't a tenant, correct? Yeah. Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. As far as you know, they were not a tenant. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. May be excused? Yes, you can step down. You may excuse. We have a brief witness ready, Judge. Okay. Your lunch is not here yet. Thank you. I'm going to keep them hungry. Usually their lunch is here very early. Where you got to go is a true stop for that. I do. All right, can you please step up? And can you have a seat? And could you state your name for the record and spell it your first and last name? Uh, David Metzke, D A V I D, Metzke, M E T Z K E. Go ahead, ask him. Thank you. Good morning, sir. How are you? Doing well, how are you? Fine, thanks. Yeah. Tell us, please, how you're employed. Uh, currently employed with uh, Detroit Police Department. And how long have you been a police officer with Detroit? Uh, close to seven and a half years. Okay. Tell us, please, what's your current assignment? Uh, currently assigned to the Detroit Special Response Team. Tell the jury, please, what exactly is the Detroit Special Response Team? So that is uh, the SWAT team for the Detroit Police Department. Okay. Uh, tell us, what are some of the responsibilities associated with the team member of the Detroit Police Special Response Team. Okay, so our primary jobs are barricaded persons, uh, hostage situations, dignitary protection, high risk search warrant, and future apprehension. Okay. How often would you say that you engage in these sort of duties? So I'm close to 60 barricade or hostage situations right now, and I would say a little over 200 warrants right now. Okay. Is this something that is a SWAT team member or special response team member you do on a a daily or weekly basis? Every day. Okay. <clears throat> and how long have you been a member of the special response team? Going on four years. Four years, okay. I'd like to direct your attention to about 11.30 p.m. on Friday, December the 3rd, 2021. Do you recall that date and time? I do. And were you working or were you called in? I was called in. And tell us what that means, please. So I was probably sleeping at that time. Uh, my work phone goes off because we're always on call. Um, so it's blasting, you wake up, you look at your phone, and depending on what you get called in, so that day we were called in for a future of apprehension, um, we're told to report to the base, uh, I reported my base. The Grandma. Detroit Police Special Response Team base? Yes, sir. Okay, and then what do you do there? Uh, then I gather all my equipment up, so you know, you grab your uh, rifle, your body armor, um, your belt, anything you need for your objective for the night. Okay, were you told at that point why you were being called in specifically? We knew we were going for uh, two fugitives. Okay. And so um, you got to the base and then you obtained your gear? Correct. And what happens next? Uh, then I was loaded onto the Bearcat, which is our smaller armored vehicle. Uh, and then we go from there to our assigned address. Okay. Where we're going to be. 
So if I understand you correctly, there are other members of the special response team with you at the base at that point? Yes, sir. And you said we loaded on the Bearcat, so that means other members loaded onto the vehicle as well? Yes, sir. Okay, do you recall how many? I would say around six. Six? Okay. And you traveled together to the um, location you were called for? Yes, sir. Would that be 1111 Bellevue in Detroit? Yes, sir. Okay. So give us an idea sort of where this uh, location is. So the closest geographic, I would say, would be like Belle Isle. Uh, okay. I could go like Belle Isle and then west off of Jefferson. It's like the closest I can describe it. Now, do you recall approximately what time you would have arrived there? It was late. I know we got recalled late, like almost 12. And 12 is it midnight? 12 midnight, correct. Okay. Um, so I would say it took me about 20 minutes to get from my house to the base, and then after loading the equipment up, probably about 20, 25 minutes from our base to the location. All right. Tell us, please, what you observed when you arrived at that location. So we were one of the uh, last officers there because um, there's two different teams on the special response team. There's a reactive team, the uh, first guys that have take-homes, and they go directly to the scene. Take-homes, take-home vehicles? Correct. Okay. And then the second set of the team, which I'm on, they go to the base and get all the equipment, and then they go to the scene. So we were probably one of the last officers that arrived to the scene at the time. Okay. So when you, when you arrived there, can you give us a number, approximately how many other law enforcement personnel you observed? So I can't give you a hard number, but I can tell you when we pulled up in the armor, it was it was packed. Like I've I've been to a lot of stuff, right? The street was like I didn't even know what I was honestly pulling up on when we did that. When we pull up in that small bearcat, I was like, well, all right, I guess we're we're doing this. And uh, it was there was tons of officers. The street was it was packed. It was busy. Now, tons of officers. Are we talking about like just Detroit or other departments as well? Um, I couldn't like once I got in the building, I could tell you more. But pulling up, I just seen, I just seen a lot of cop cars. Okay. So it's, when you arrived, you made that observation. Did you meet with other team members? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what happens next? So I got off the Bearcat. I grabbed the Halligan, which is like, uh, like a pry bar. So we're taught that you have to grab um, your Halligan and a ram because you never know what you're going into. Can you describe what those two things are, please? Yeah. So your Halligan, it's going to have like a sharp point on it and like rabbit tails on the end of it. And it's like a bar like... Are you talking about three feet long or so? I would say, yeah. Okay. Safe to say. Uh, then you have your ram, and we use a maritime ram, so it's probably about like about this big. It's like 35 pounds, and it has a block on it about that big. Okay, just so we have a little bit of idea of making a record here, uh, about a foot, a foot and a half long, or? Uh, two feet, safe to say. Okay. Yeah. And you said there's an, an, an end on it? A square end, yeah. A square end, and, yeah. and that's, what, six inches diameter? Yeah, I would say it's safe to say, yeah. Okay. And, and what is that made out of, out of it, you know? Uh, it's enough to break the door down, so okay. it's steel. Okay. And you said it's about 35 pounds? Yes. All right. So you grab those two tools, and then what happens? I grab the Hellion. So the Hellion. It'd be too much to carry your rifle, all your equipment, a ram and halo. So I grabbed the Hellion. Um, I came off the barricade and then I made entry to the door. It was like a smaller door. I remember coming in and then like going left. And when I got in, there was like a lot of officers there, my team members there, guys in jeans with like police vests on, like a marshal. There was there was a lot going on when I walked in. Okay, I'm going to show you what's been admitted as people's 306. Is that photograph front of you, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. And do you recognize what's in this photograph? Yes, sir. And tell me what this is, please. Uh, that's the scene where we uh, responded to you. Okay. And the, is that photograph fairly accurately depict what that building was on the evening or the night of December the 3rd, 2021? Oh, yeah. It was, I mean, to me, you got to think I'm coming in at 1 a.m., you know, dark time. It was a warehouse. Okay. That's what I remember there. And here's 307. Is this the same building, just a different view? Yeah, that looks like the door I walked in. See how it's like a smaller door? To the left of the picture here? Yeah, to the left. Uh, right there, yeah. Okay. That's where I remember recall walking into a door similar to that. Okay, and that's... Tell us again what you encountered when you went in that door. So I came in, and then I went left. And when I came in, I remember I had my team members here, which our team members, they're very, like, distinctive. Like, we all wear black, and uh, you have your SRT patch on, and you have your, you know, Kevlar helmet on. We're very distinct. And then you have other officers like patrol or you know unmarked officers. So I knew who I was going to run into with my team. Okay, so you have one standard uniform, SRT guys. Correct. Okay, and you mentioned earlier 
um, individuals with jeans and vests that say police or correct. Okay. Yep. So when you walked in at that point, could you give us an idea of how many law enforcement personnel you saw? There was there was a lot. Okay. A lot is in more than ten. Yeah. Okay. Sir. Um, more than twenty. Safe to say there was. I would say yeah, twenty if not more. Okay. And this this building here, depicted in People's Exhibit 307, there's multiple floors. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. So. When you walked in, you, you mentioned you rendezvous with your team. Yes, Tell us what happens next. So we moved, uh, I met up with my sergeant, and uh, you know they told us that what we're going to do, we're going to start moving through this building. We're going to be looking for these fugitives. So uh, SRT will clear you know the first level, second level, third level, and move on up. So once we got in there, uh, I remember coming in. There was a hallway to the right. There was a hallway to the left, and then it kind of went like this. And there was like two bathrooms on the side here. Okay. So, did Detroit Police have one specific assignment then? Detroit, Detroit Police? The, uh, uh, SRT. SRT, yes. Yes, at that time, correct. Okay. So, tell us what happened going through this initial assignment. So, we were looking for two fugitives. We started on the first level, and we started um, breaching, breaking down doors. Okay. Um, let me pause you right there. Breaching or breaking down doors. Tell us, please, what that entails. So, you're using that RAM that I kind of explained, right? Um, it's usually one of the bigger guys on the team. Go ahead. It's a really, it's a spe specific form. It's the way you swing back, and you're you're using a ram specifically to bypass the lock on a door. So you, you're pushing it in with the force. Okay. Did you use this tool on on one door or multiple doors on the first floor? Uh, I would I would call us using it on multiple. I would say. Not more than three, but I, I would say say at least two to three. Okay, and that's on the first floor. What about on the second or third floors? So I remember before we even got there, we had K9 down there too, which was with us. K9 is in, is in police dogs. Correct. Okay. Um, from there, somebody said that somebody notified our team that two fugitives may be possibly in the second floor, and they never came down. So we went upstairs. When we got upstairs, there was another another SWAT team. It wasn't, I'm not sure what SWAT team it was. It could have been a federal SWAT team. It wasn't Detroit, though. No, it was not Detroit. Okay. So we got up there. They told us that there was locked doors, but they cleared the open doors at that time. So sooner or later, our team got a hold of a ring, like full of keys. And I'm talking like it was a ring, like 100 keys. And there you go. Well, these are the keys to this building. Use it, if, you know, so we stop breaking down our doors. So we started unlocking doors in the second story and clearing it out. And okay. Then, uh, that's on the second floor? Correct. Okay, but that's after doors were already breached on the first floor? Correct. Okay. Um, this is Exhibit 309, just to confirm. This is a the same building, 1111 Bellevue in Detroit, just from a different view? Oh, correct. Yes, okay, sir. correct. Okay, thank you. <laughs> now, after you obtained, or your team obtained that ring of keys on the second floor, did you obtain information that the wanted fugitives could be somewhere in the building? Oh uh, yes, sir. Okay, and do you recall where that was? So we were notified. At least I was notified that the fugitives may be downstairs in a particular room. So our team went back downstairs to the particular room and we lined up. And okay, particular room was it Suite One Thirty? I would say it's safe to say. Okay, so that would be on the first floor. Um, prior to that information being obtained by, by your team, that door was not breached, is that correct? Correct. Okay, were doors around that suite breached? Yes, sir. Okay. Is that a loud process or a quiet one? It's, it's going to be loud. Okay. And that's because you, you described the 35-pound the ram and what it's used for? Yeah, break, you're breaking down. Yeah. You're okay. slamming a door. Now, on this particular evening, December 3rd, 2021, well, first of all, let me ask you, um, do you recall the approximate time that you entered Suite 130 at this location? Uh, I don't know the exact... It was late. I know it was late. I know we were clearing probably for at least 40 minutes before we got there. Okay. And that's your particular team clearing for 40 minutes? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm saying me, me, me specifically with my team. Okay. Thank you. Um, were you equipped with body-worn camera? Uh, yes, sir. Vanison? Okay. And if we had a date and time stamp from that body worn camera, would that tell us specifically when it occurred? Yes, sir. I'm going to show you what's been admitted as People's 304. This is body worn camera from that. Date.
just to confirm here, we have a date of December 4th, 2021, uh, 1.34 a.m. And your name is on the bottom of this? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, do you recognize this as being your body-worn camera footage? Yes, sir. responsibility would be in this situation would be to find and make secure the fugitives but not to search the location? Correct. Okay. Here, here, bro. Oh, never mind. 
seconds. This, this is the hallway right outside of the suite where they were found in that, in that location? Yes, sir. Okay, does this give an idea of the number of law enforcement personnel outside of that suite at that time? Yes, sir. Thank you. I have nothing for the judge. Cross? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Yeah. Your role with Detroit Special Response Team, um, one of the things that you do is fugitive apprehension. Yes, ma'am. Fugitive apprehension is typically when there's a, a person who is not coming in to address allegations or charges against them, correct? I would say that's okay. correct. 
usually fugitive apprehension is um, you get involved when it, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay. if it becomes clear that that person is not going to come in on their own. Well, I'm just going to object to the form of the question, Judge. He's testified that he gets notified of when to report to base. He's given an assignment, you know, he does the assignment. Yeah, are you the one who decides that? N no. In fact, you receive information from your supervisors. Yes, ma'am. And you have no knowledge of the truth to the information that you receive. Truth or inaccuracy, either way. And I, I believe my supervisor is not to lie to me, so I'm listening to the order. So you get a phone call and you go to the station? Yes, ma'am. You testified that there were, I think you said, tons of officers at 1111 Bellevue on December, well, it would have been December 4th of 2021. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, December 4th. Yes, sir. You knew that there was a shooting at Oxford High School on November 30th of 2021? Yes, sir. You had seen media coverage about it? Yes, sir. You were aware of it? I believe so, yes. Were you also aware that James and Jennifer Crumbly had been charged in connection with the shooting on November 30th? Uh, I can't say I remember or not. Okay. You don't specifically recall seeing that they were charged? Is that a no? Uh, no. Thank you, Your Honor. Exhibit 306 um, was a photo of the exterior of 1111 Bellevue. Your testimony was that you remembered it as a warehouse? Yes, ma'am. You learned that it was actually uh, a building that had multiple businesses in it, correct? Yes, ma'am. You knew who you were looking for in 1111 Bellevue that night? Yes, ma'am. You had been given photographs? Uh, I believe so. Descriptions? I believe so. You knew that they were the parents of the Oxford High School shooter? Yes, ma'am. And you received that information from your supervisors or from the other officers when you arrived on scene? I would say it's safe to see our supervisors. Okay. Because the reason I ask that is because you, you testified that when you pulled up onto Bellevue, you didn't know what you were there for. So I, I wanted to clarify that you, before you entered 1111 Bellevue, you were given information about why you were entering. I knew I was going for a future apprehension. And who it was? No, at the time I made entry, we found out pretty much who it was, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Entry into the building? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You testified that you received information while you were inside of Bellevue that um, the individuals may be on the second floor and may not have come down. Do you remember that testimony? Yes, ma'am. That was not true, correct? Yes. Yes. You learned that that was not true? Yes. The video from your body-worn camera, which starts at 1.34 a.m. and 20 seconds on the timestamp, or it looks like 18 seconds on the timestamp, um, it's quiet when your video starts, correct? Correct. You can hear yes. like a little bit of your movement with your equipment and stuff, but otherwise, you don't hear yelling, you don't hear um, any other sounds, correct? Yes, sir. You would agree with that? Yes, sir. You recall when you entered the unit, um, obviously it was dark. That's it. Yeah, didn't leave it. You don't recall seeing police lights in the windows of the of the room, if you recall? Uh, yeah, ma'am, I don't pay, I wasn't paying attention there. But. You were looking at the people that were on the bed, right? Yes. In the middle of the room. Yes, ma'am. In fact, when you entered the, the unit, when you and your team entered the unit, James and Jennifer Crumbly were laying on a mattress in the middle of the room, which we saw. Yes. Uh, James was laying on his side, if you recall? Uh, if you recall. I mean, it appears to be in the video. They weren't covered with boxes or anything like that, correct? No. There was a, I think Jennifer Crumbly had a blanket on, otherwise James was completely uncovered. It's, 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 he slowly rolled over as, as you all were giving him commands, correct? Uh, it looks like that. I think I was paying more attention to uh, Jennifer. Okay. So... You don't recall him doing anything that would cause you all to be concerned. He didn't jump up. He didn't start to run. He didn't become combative. None of that happened from what you recall. Um, I would say he did none of that. But as far as our team goes, um, we're trying to take every caution as it, as it is. It, it, you know, we treat every person the same. We come up high. And then their reaction is how we go from it. And it's safe to say when SRT gets involved, it's typically, and you talked about high risk, dangerous, so you're going into these scenarios already at a heightened level 
of concern or security or awareness. Is that fair? Yes, sir. You don't you don't walk into the situation without all of your uniform on and your equipment and everything else thinking, oh, this is no big deal. No, we don't do that. Because when your unit gets involved, typically it gets involved in situations that are serious. Correct. And you guys are given information about situations that are serious. Correct. You guys meaning your unit. Yes, You can hear yelling, if you recall. You hear yelling on the video, and, and if you know, you later learn that that was James Crumbly. Okay. He wasn't yelling at officers. Okay. Yes, you, no, you recall that? Yeah, he didn't seem to be yelling at officers. Okay. He was just making sounds. It sounded almost, and if you know, it, it, if you agree, it sounded almost that like he was in pain. Uh, safe to say. And again, the mattress was in the middle of the room. James and Jennifer Crumley were on it. Yes, sir. They weren't hiding in a corner? No. They weren't hiding behind any of the, the raised countertops that were in there? Nope. They weren't hiding behind any of the um, the paintings that were in there? They weren't covering themselves with blankets? No. Nope. If you recall, your unit received information that James and Jennifer Crumley may have a weapon with them. Yeah. So, Ma'am, I can uh, I recall. We just treat as... Every person that we're going after as if they're possible is a weapon. Now, you you all searched the that unit and you did not find any weapons. No, ma'am. And you searched both James and Jennifer Crumbly and there was nothing found on them either. Somebody did. I, I didn't. Get somebody, okay. did. somebody searched them. Correct. Okay. And we talked about this a little bit at the beginning. It's not your job to verify whether or not the information that you receive is accurate, correct? Correct. Your job is to get the call, right? You go to the base, Correct. you get your equipment on, you load into whatever vehicle you're taking, and you go to the scene that you've been called to. Yes, ma'am. Now, when the investigations are being done by your own department, you tend to have a little more information at the beginning. Is that fair? Me, myself? Your unit. So, norm yes, ma'am. I would say normally during uh, times that we get called out, it starts high and then it comes to us. That makes sense. High in the rankings. Yes. So it would go to your supervisor or their supervisor and it gets filtered down to you. Yes, ma'am. And if you recall, at around six minutes and 40 seconds on the video, I don't remember what the timestamp was, you can hear um, James Crumbly say we were leaving at 7 in the morning. Do you remember hearing that in the video? Uh, I'm going to check to that, Judge. Has there been any testimony of that, nor has there been any indication that that happened? It, it's on the video, Your Honor. Well, then I think the video should speak for itself for the jury to make the determination. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, you um, can rely on what you see in the evidence and on the video, all right? Do you recall hearing that on the video? Oh, man, we can run it back. Okay. Uh, no. I can put it there. It's at 624. This is 3 or 5, correct? Yes, Your Honor. I don't know if that audio is working. So this is the second time that you watched the video, so uh, yeah, I can Again, this witness can't interpret what he thinks somebody else may have heard. His camera obviously is three people away from where James Crumley's in the video. The video would speak for itself. It does. She, she has to convert it. And he asked me to play the video back, Your Honor. Yeah, he said, if you want to play it back, go ahead. I mean, well, in response to a question of, did you hear that? Okay, so did you hear it? Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions. Redirect. Sir, did you learn that they had active arrest warrants at the time you arrived on scene? Um, I can't. I don't recall. I in order for a fugitive arrest to occur, you need active warrant. arrest warrants. Yes, sir. Okay. And why would you be quiet right before you entered Suite 130? Um, so that's a form of a tactic. So we're trying to. We got, if, if you can see, we use keys, correct? Yes. 
You can have two options. We could ram the door, throw a flashbang in, cause diversionary, or you can come in and be quiet. It would be a shock effect that way. So our supervisors make the decision to use the keys, unlock it, and use it as a surprise effect. That so everyone being quiet in the hallway, that was intentional as a tactic before you entered this particular suite? Yes. Now, the um, using the ram, that wasn't a quiet tactic, was it? No. Okay, so... The noise level that would have been depicted before those doors were breached right around this suite here would have been much different? Yes. Thank you, nothing further. Briefly, Ryan. You have no knowledge of your own whether or not James Crumbly heard anything that was going on outside of that suite, correct? No. Thank you. No further questions, sir. No. All right, um, you can step down and you're excused. Thank you. Can I have you return at 1.30 after lunch? Don't discuss the case with anyone. Don't research anything. Don't look at any media. Don't go on Facebook. You know the girl, right? Okay. okay. We'll see you back at 1.30. Okay. All rise for the jury.
All right. Thank you, Judge. Um, could everyone remain seated while the defendant is court? Thanks.
All right. Your Honor, calling people versus James Crumbly, case number 22279989FH. Thank you, Marquis. On behalf of the people. Karen McDonald, on behalf of the people. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Marielle Lehman, on behalf of James Crumbly, who is standing to my left. Are you sure? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Miss Williams, would you mind? Who's the next witness? William Creer. Spelling. Last name spelled C R E E R. Go ahead, Pastor. All right, thank you. Mr. Creer, um, I just want to acknowledge that you just came from a very long shift, so you're you're a little tired. Um, so we're not going to keep you on the stand very long. Can you tell the jury what your, your job is? No problem. I'm a forensic technician for the Detroit Police Department. You can commonly call it a crime scene investigator. Uh, my job is to go to the crime scenes, collect, uh, take pictures, collect evidence, and uh, generate a report and testify in court. I can testify now. Okay. So as your job as a, um, a crime scene, um, uh, would you say investigator? That's fine. Okay. Um, it's important to uh, distinguish. Are you a member, actually, of law enforcement? I work for law enforcement, yes. All right. Are you considered um, a police officer? No, I'm not. All right. Is that then, would you consider yourself a civilian? Yes. All right. Um, How, how long have you worked um, as a, uh, a crime scene investigator? 20 years. And all of those years have that, have you worked for the Detroit Police Department? Yes, sir. I want to draw your attention to December 4th of 2021. Were you working that day? Yes, I was. And were you, are you, um, are you on shifts or are you on, on call? How does that work? We're on shifts. Uh, my shift I currently work on is from uh, 12 a.m. to 8 uh, to, yeah, 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. And are you at home during this time or call when necessary, or are you actually in an office? I'm in the office. Okay. Um, on, De on December uh, 4th, uh, were you dispatched that day, if you know, to an address of 1111 Bellevue in Detroit? Yes, I was. Okay. Do you, do you know about what time you received that dispatch? Uh, I believe around 2 o'clock. In the morning? Yes. Okay. Um, were you aware if there was a search warrant that um, was being executed? Oh, the request we got over radio was there was a search warrant executed at that location. All right. And what were your initial thoughts when you were dispatched to the location about what your your purpose there was? All we knew at the time was, was a search warrant at the location. Uh, we really didn't know anything else about it previously until we pulled up. All right. And when you pulled up, what was your observation? Objection on irrelevance. When he pulled up to the scene, and overall, thank you. A lot of uh, news cameras around, so we were like, "Okay, this is interesting." In addition to the news cameras, though, what what was the scene like in terms of was law enforcement already on scene? 
did you did you know who was what had happened that and that in that scene? At that time, we didn't still exactly have uh, any of the real details. All we knew at the time was it was a search warrant, um, and we were there to collect evidence uh, regarding the search warrant. Uh, when we pulled up, there was, uh, of course, like I mentioned before, news cameras all around and uh, heavy police presence. All right, and then what happened? Uh, then when we uh, reached the scene, uh, we talked to the officer in charge, and then that's when we uh, were notified what this case was actually involved, uh, involved with. And what were you told? Uh, that this was a, that the case was involving a crime. Can you, can you just raise your voice just a little bit, please? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I was trying to I knew you could speak louder. No problem. The mm -hmm. uh, case was involving the, uh, the shooting incident, um, and this was the location that search warrant was being uh, authorized, and two people were arrested. Is that all you were told? Yes. Okay. And did, were you directed to a certain part um, of the building? Uh, uh, suite 130 of the location you mentioned. Were you by yourself or with someone else? I had a partner. And who's that? Uh, the partner, Stephanie uh, Sparks. Do you normally um, process the scene uh, with by yourself or with another partner? Uh, midnight, you process scenes with partners. Okay. And uh, once you arrived at the suite, uh, were you and your partner the only one there? Were you the only ones there, or who else was there? The scene was secured by the police, uh, by the church police. What does that mean, secure? It uh, means that uh, there were that this uh, secured, so that way there's no outside interference coming inside the building, no one tampering with evidence, uh, and everything is there as it was when the search warrant was executed. And is that a typical thing and, and that you encounter in your job? That Do you arrive to scenes once it's cleared and, and secured, and, um, or are you sometimes there at the same time, a lot's going on? Oh, no. Well, the, we're there when the, after the scene is secured. Okay. Um, so what is your job when you arrive on the scene that day? When I arrive at the scene, we talk to the officer in charge of the scene. Uh, we then walk through the scene. Uh, he points out items of interest. Remember, keep your voice up. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, we, he points out items of interest that he might want collected. Uh, my partner and I will then walk through the scene. We'll also pay attention to see what's around. We then would suggest additional items if any to collect and, uh, you know, allow us to look around a little bit more. And then uh, after that, we take pictures, collect evidence, and uh, package evidence, turn it in. All right, Mr. Kerr, is there a difference between um, collecting evidence and searching? Yes. And do you, are you assigned to do both? It depends on the situation. Yeah, in this, in this situation, we uh, we collected the evidence. The search warrant was already executed, and we did addition, we looked around additionally. All right. And what makes you start searching other places? Uh, the fact that you know we were we looked around and, and we said, yeah, the the oh, I see, I can't remember the name at the time. Uh, they were searching the around a little bit more. Okay. Um, I'm going to um, show you what's been marked as um, people's exhibits 306. 307, 309, through 320, 322 to 358. I believe these have all been admitted. Um, Mr. Pierre, what is that? Uh, that's the scene location. All right. And again, it's the north side of the scene location. Okay. Again, we're at the north side of the scene location. All right. Um, can you see the windows on the suite that you uh, searched? Uh, I believe the windows on the scene of the search because the, the actual suite 130 is located on the northeast side of the building. So I would say the, the two windows closest to uh, closest to the left side of the street. Okay. And then, do you know what this is? Yes, that was the vehicle we were directed to uh, at the at the crime scene. Oh, yes. you also searched the vehicle? No, we didn't search the vehicle. Okay. We took pictures of the vehicle. Okay, got it. Um, what did you learn about the car? Anything? Did you collect, did you take pictures of anything around the car, in the car? We took pictures around the car, and then also around the car there were cigarette butts we collected. You collected the cigarette butts? Yes, ma'am. And is, what is this a picture of? Uh, those are pictures of the cigarette butts. All right, do you remember how many were there? Not, at, not off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, did you bring a report with you today? I did bring a report. Would that refresh your recollection? It would. All right, could you have a look at it and just let me know when you are ready to answer that question. Collected a total of 14 cigarette butts. Okay. 
Anything else around the car? Uh, is that a picture? What, is, what are we looking at? <laughs> the picture is behind the vehicle and uh, more cigarette butts. And you collected those? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. And 312 and then 313. What is that? Uh, the Sweep 130. Okay. Is that is that researched? Yes. All right. And is that typical? You just take pictures of... What do you take pictures of as a matter of protocol? No problem. We take pictures of the area um, in this in this particular situation. That's the I mean the actual uh, room number. So of course we take pictures of the front door and room number as we enter through. We take pictures of the area to see if there's any damage to the door, if any, if the door was breached, if it wasn't breached, if there was any damage at all. Was there any damage to this door? No, none observed. Okay, and the next slide is three fourteen. Do you recognize that? Yes, that's the actual scene inside of the scene location one third. Okay. And then 315, is is that also in, from a different angle? Yes, as we enter the room, that would be to the north. And those windows that we see, do you know where they face? Uh, they are also facing north. Would those be the windows you just pointed out in the pre previous slide? Yes, ma'am. Okay. This is another angle? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what is this? This is directly in front of the door, so that would be to the east side of the door. Uh, did you observe a mattress in this building, in this room? There was a mattress in the room. Do you see it in this picture? Mm, uh, you kind of see it towards the bottom of the screen. Yeah, right there. Okay. And the next slide? Uh, to the bottom right hand corner of the screen you see the mattress with the drawers on top of it oh that's the mattress yes okay all right and then i'm just going to show you some slides and um, pictures of the scene and you can just describe what angle it is and what you if, if you see anything of significance to point out to the jury yeah. okay again you see the mattress uh some uh, you see the, uh, the drawers um, you also see going just to the right of the mattress. Remember to keep your voice screen. up a little bit. Sorry, mm -hmm. to the right of the mattress towards the edge of the screen, you see a, a table with two solo cups. Right there? Yes. Okay. What is this? Uh, again, we're right at the mattress. Um, at the, uh, I guess that would be the left side of the mattress, you have some clothes uh, and a baseball cap. Okay, and the next slide. Why, what's significant about this, if anything? Uh, you got the mattress in the bottom uh, right hand of the picture. Uh, towards the left hand of the uh, left hand of the picture, right in front of the little shelving units on the floor, you have a Snipes uh, clothing bag. All right. And at some point, did you remove the uh, items in the, in the bag? Yes, ma'am. Is this the picture of those items? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell the jury what we found? Uh, uh, did you see in the picture a, couple, a few pairs of socks? Uh, receipt, uh, sweatshirt. And are the socks, uh, do they appear to be worn or new? Those are brand new. All right. Is there, do I see a receipt in that picture? Yes, you do. Okay. Um, we're going to get to that in just a second. The next slide. What are we looking at? Uh, you're looking, uh, you're looking just, that's the mattress to our right, and to the left there's some Shelby units, but right in the middle is a sweater. Okay. Just for context, when you say right or left, when you're looking at this picture, uh, where would the, where's the door? Ah, got you. Uh, the door would be to the west of the mattress. So to the top uh, right of the? To the, it'll be just to the, uh, on the right side of the screen, towards the right border of the screen. Okay. And is that the article of clothing we just saw in the previous uh, yes, slide? Okay, what is it? It's a sweater, as I mentioned before. All right, do you know if it's male or female? It uh, looks like a female sweater. Okay, and the next slide. Where where did this come from? Uh, right now, if I remember correctly, uh, this is going to be towards the east side of the room, and that's a sweat, uh, just a regular shirt. And you see further on a few pairs of, of, of other 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 articles of clothes. Okay. The next slide is. Where is this in relation to the room? Uh, in relation to the room, uh, as you see through previous slides, there was a table. It, the table would be along the south the side. the table right next to the mattress of the solo cups? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, this this area is behind the table, and that's a pink book bag. It uh, was in a, um, a plastic tote container. 
Was the tote, um, did it have a lid on it or was it without a lid? It was without a lid when we brought it. With or without? Without. Okay. Um, do you know, did anybody take the lid off or was it found like that when the individuals were arrested? Objection, Your Honor, speculation. I don't know how he would know that. I started out with, do you know? No, do I don't, know? Know. I don't oh. recall. Okay, thank you. Um, and was there anything else in this this container other than the backpack? Uh, I'd have to go further through the pictures. Okay. What is this? Uh, that's the, the table that is uh, right in front of the tote to look at. Okay. And can you tell the jury what, what was on this table? Uh, you have food stuffs like bananas, orange juice, and fertilizer bottle, um, a Coke uh, Coca Cola bottle, uh, and solo cups. All right. And the next slide? Next slide, we're right back at the tote with the book bag. All right. And what's this? Uh, we're going. This is the part where we're right. We're getting ready to go through the tote, uh, through the book bag that we just uh, pulled out of the tote. And what do you see? Uh, to I'm sorry. What did you find in the back? <laughs> okay, to the left of the book bag, uh, towards the top of the screen, uh, you have a smaller little bag. We also, as you go, as we're going to go pro uh, progress through the pictures, uh, you're going to see uh, various articles of clothing. That's okay. Cool. Next slide. Again, we're going through progressive through pictures. You have various articles of clothing, and we still have that little smaller uh, bag right there on top of the book bag. Was there anything in that bag? I have to look at my report for first one. Okay, go ahead. I don't believe that's the great parts. Could we have the rest of the pictures? Sure, sure. What's to the left on, the, on there? Uh, to the left, you have a pair of uh, black jeans. Do you know if they're male or female? I believe they're female. All right. And the next slide is 332. What is that a picture of? Another picture, uh, it's, uh, another picture of the black jeans. Okay. And the slide after that? Uh, you see the, the brand of the, of the jeans. You see their high rise skinny stretch jeans. And you can see uh, the size on the tag if you zoom in. Right. Size 12. Okay. And the next slide. Uh, where were where were these articles found? Those articles were inside the uh, inside the pink book bag. Okay. And can you tell the jury what what is in that picture? And inside the picture, you have uh, uh, you see a syringe. Uh, I'd have to go through my notes to recall what the, was actually inside the syringe. Uh, you also have uh, uh, some pills just at the bottom of the screen. And then on the inside the bag, you also see a bank envelope. A what? A bank envelope. A bank envelope, okay. Do you know what the pills were for, or what they were? Um, not off the top of my head, no. Is it in your report? Let me look at my report. Okay, me. yes. And, and while you're doing that, would it refresh your recollection about the syringe? Uh, yes, because okay. I, I would call that it's definitely a report. Okay. Syringe was the exceed uh, the prescription for medication for horse. Okay. That's the syringe that you see in the picture inside the bag. And I don't have a description of the pills. Okay. In the next slide, do you see a better description of the back of the pills there? Yes. Does that refresh your recollection? Uh, yes, either like caffeine pills or something like that. Vibrin? Yes. All right. And the next slide, that's the what you just talked about. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And what is this? Uh, those are the clothes, those are articles of clothing that I described earlier. And can you 
uh, list those? Uh, they are female intimate garments, underwear and bras. And do you know how many pair of underwear? No, I'm talking about Okay. Uh, in the next slide, what is that? Uh, that is the, uh, the hotel room key. It was a side of black jacket, and that was along the northeast corner of the room. Okay. And the next slide is 339. What is this? Uh, it's a picture of a whiskey container. It's in a garbage can. All right. And the next slide is a receipt. What is this receipt for? It's from the River Town Mart. We found the receipt on the table. As you see on the, uh, as we go through the pictures, you have the various items that are on the receipt. Um, I believe there, the next picture also has the date on the receipt as well. Yeah. What is this? Uh, that is going to be a plastic tote with an avocado inside the tote. Okay. And I remember the last time you testified, you weren't sure what that was. Exactly. You've since learned it was an avocado. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, what else is in that picture with the avocado? Um, it's a, a, a aluminum container, similar to what you would use for, like, baking. Lasagna? Lasagna. Okay. And what's inside of it? Uh, Melting ice uh, in an ice bag. So there was there was it completely melted or was it still cold? At the time, it was completely yes, completely completely melted. Um, yeah, at the time, it was completely melted. Was it still cold? No. Okay. The next slide. What is this? Um, it's a receipt. Is it the receipt that we just the um, talked about at Rivertown? I will have to look at the picture before because you see at the top of the receipt has fourteen, and on a previous picture. Yes, that's the bottom of the receipt. Okay. And what's the date on that? Uh, the date on the receipt is 12-3-2021. And at the time you are searching this, is is it December 3rd or December 4th? It will be December 4th. Okay. And it, is the, and the actual time of the purchase? Uh, 4 9 p.m. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next slide is, what is it? <laughs> yeah, this picture of the mattress we talked about earlier. Okay. Um, the next slide is 344. Tell the jury what this is and why you took a picture of it. Uh, it's a picture of the totes that will be around the east side of the room. Um, the reason why we took pictures of the totes is because we saw the, the one tote that was already open before. Uh, these totes look kind of funny or kind of just look like they probably kind of was messed with or jostled with at the time. So we decided to uh, take pictures of the open one. Okay, and just so that every... The, the jury understands. I want to go back to uh, slide 14. Can you feel that number? Okay. It's to show the bear. Maybe this one. Sorry. Okay. So do I have this right? There were two separate plastic totes that you found, you discovered items in? Yes. Okay, and were they found in the same place? No. All right, you testified earlier that, that the, the tote with the pink backpack, where did you find that? The tote with the pink backpack, if you go through the picture, uh, you see the table just to the uh, left side of the screen in that corner. That's where the one tote with the pink book bag is located. So um, how far away from the mattress? Uh, it's the mattress, table, and the tote. Okay, so a foot, two feet? About a foot, yeah. Well, okay. About a foot, yes. Okay. And then you found, you said you searched and, and discovered more items in a different tote. Yes. Though where was that? Uh, towards the top of the screen, you have the yellow uh, scaffolding or whatever holding the totes. Then behind those, behind that area, behind the table right there would be the next uh, uh, area of totes. Okay. So it, is it on that scaffolding you found it? Right behind it. Right behind, right behind the table. Right behind there? Yes. Okay. So could you, was that visible when you walked into the room? No, as you walk into the room, you look around, you you know, during the search of the area. Okay, so that that tote that was found on the other side of the room, what was discovered, if anything, in that tote? Uh, in that tote, that's where we found the purse with the money, uh, as we go through. Okay, one moment. Okay, was the tote found in that condition? And I guess what I'm asking is, was there a lid on it? Oh, uh, you see the lid on it. That as we take pictures, you see it as as is as we present, as we progress. Okay. Next slide. 
What is that? Again, you saw you see the toe being moved over a little bit. You see the purse. Okay. What is this? Yeah, it's now we're looking inside the purse. All right. And then the pictures, is this how you do it? You take a picture of the first item and then all of the things that you take out of it? Yes, ma'am. We take oh. it in progression. Okay. Sorry, you told me that. All right. Next slide. What is this? Uh, you see the bank envelopes. You see a search warrant under the bank envelopes. And uh, uh, you see the two bank envelopes as well, top of it. Uh, a search warrant, what? what is that? You know, as you see at the top of the screen, is the warrant tabulation return. Okay. And that was found in the bag or in the tote? Uh, the, the, the bank envelopes were found in the purse. Uh, the search warrants were just on, on the table. Okay. Um, and then the next slide, what is that? Uh, you're again looking inside the purse and you see cash right in a smaller pocket of the purse. Were, was there anything in the bank envelopes? Uh, yes, there's money in the bank envelopes as well. All right. And you see cash in this picture. Is this step in addition to what you found in the bank envelopes? Yes. Okay. And if you remember, and if not, you can look at your notes, how much total, what was the total um, amount of cash found in that hand, in that handbag? I'd have to look at the notes. I know it was around $6,000. Do you want to just correct? Do yes. Sure correct? $6,617. Okay. And uh, those are... We'll get to it. I'm not going to do that again. Okay, next slide. That's just a close-up? Yes, ma'am. All right. This slide after this. This uh, is three, exhibit 350, and there's kind of a lot going on in this picture. Can you explain to the jury what you see? No problem. Uh, in the picture, you see four cell phones. Uh, one of the cell phones uh, appears to be busted and broken. Those are the condition of the cell phones. Uh, those are the condition of collected cell phones. Uh, you also see the keys just to the left of the cell phones. Uh, they were collected, they were turned over to the unit at the scene so they can collect and move the card. Uh, you also see a bank card and uh, some prescription medication just to the top of the bank, just to the top and left of the bank card. Okay, the next slide. Uh, that's a close-up picture of the keys. And the bank card, is that a traditional bank card if you know? No, I don't know. Okay, the next slide. Uh, you have a close-up picture of the medication I mentioned before. And do you know what these medications were? No. I see Adderall and two other things. So. Okay, and do you know who they're prescribed to? Uh, you see Jennifer Crumley on the all three. Well, you can see it better on the bottle to the right. And the other two bottles, you can kind of see Jennifer and Crumley. All right, and the next picture? Again, it's a picture of the four cell phones. Were any of these cell phones powered on? No. How do you know that? Uh, because if they were, probably we take again take pictures of the items in condition that you collected. They were all off. Exactly. And then the next picture. What is this? Uh, it's pictures of the, of the money we collected from the purse. So you actually lay out each bill. Yes. Okay. And the next photo. Uh, more pictures of the money. And the two after that. Yep. All right. And then the the last photo here is. There was a receipt. Um, can you tell the jury what the time and date is on this receipt? 12-3-2021. Uh, and what are the items listed? Uh, giant lasagna pan, Werner's two-liter bottle, uh, paper towel, Kleenex. Okay, thank you. At what do you estimate that the, the search was completed? Uh, I have to look at my notes, definitely get the time. Okay. For the sake of time, does it around 5 a.m. sound Yeah, right around 5 a.m. Okay. And then what, wh when you were done, what did you do? What we you were directed to take pictures of the uh, prisoners. And is that a normal thing in your job? Yeah, if we were directed to, yes. Okay, so where, where were these individuals located? In uh, Oakland County uh, Jail. So you... Did you drive straight to the jail? We were directed to, yes. Okay. Um, as soon as you finished the search? Yes. Okay. And when you arrived at the Oakland County Jail, what did you do? Uh, we took pictures of both uh, both the Crumbleys individually. Uh, first, we took pictures of uh, Miss Crumbley first, and then Mr. Crumbley. So okay. And what's what's the purpose of that? Uh, the purpose of it was the fact that show any injuries that there any. Um, and uh, the condition when they were arrested. 
Okay, thank you very much. Nothing further. Sorry, I didn't hear the end of your response. Are there any injuries or their condition when they were arrested? Thank you. Cross? Yes, Your Honor. Briefly. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. As a forensic technician, your role is to document what you see at a scene, correct? Yes, ma'am. Your role is not to investigate what may have occurred prior to your arrival? No, ma'am. You testified that when you arrived at 1111 Bellevue that there were a lot of news cameras. Yes. There were uh, a lot of law enforcement, if you recall? Yes. It was kind of a, a chaotic scene. I wouldn't say chaotic, but it was it was officers and cameras at the same. You were told that you were um, you were notified you were not notified what the case was involving before arriving at 1111 Bellevue. Is that correct? Exactly. You were only told that it was a shooting incident. We were told that the we were uh, collecting for a search warrant. For a shooting incident. We were told we were collecting for a search warrant. Okay, so you weren't told anything. Uh, again, as my report says on the first page, uh, as you look at the first line, the information received. Uh, Receive a request to process the scene of a search warrant and arrest at the address 1111 Bellevue from District 1 Dispatch. And I thought that in your direct testimony with the prosecutor that you said that you were notified that the case was involving a shooting incident and that two people were arrested. Uh, I just want just to clear up, I'm not sure at the time of when he was notified at the scene versus before he left. So I, I just want to, I just want a clarification. Did you, do you recall testifying in that way? I don't recall. I, what I, what I, again, what I said, if we're talking about this specific time, was when we were, was, we were informed from District 1 of the search warrant when we were arrived, that's when we understood it was, con it was connected to the uh, shooting, shooting incident. So after you arrived at 1111 Bellevue? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for clarifying that for me. You said that when you initially get to a scene, you walk through and the officer in charge points out items of interest that he or she wants collected. Yes, ma'am. And then you may also walk through with your partner and identify additional things. Yes, ma'am. And we saw some of those things today, like the tote that you ended up taking photos of where the purse was. Is that yes, correct? You testified that you collected 14 cigarette butts. And you can look at your report if you'd like. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll stipulate he said 14. Yeah, 14. Right. He just he has his left hand. Right. And it's your understanding that, from your recollection, those cigarette butts were collected next to um, a Kia that was, we had a photograph of. Yes, sir. You testified that inside of the plastic bag, in exhibit, well, I believe it was exhibit 334, that there was a bank envelope. Um, do you, looking at the bag now, do you see that what that was? The picture's kind of blurry, but it still looks like a bank envelope. Okay, it doesn't look like a business card? It, to me, it looks like a bank envelope okay. with the black spots on top of it. Exhibit 339, uh, the prosecutor asked you to look at the inside of a garbage can, if you recall, and there was a, a whiskey bottle inside the garbage can. Yes. You don't know how that whiskey bottle got there? No. You have no knowledge of how long it had been there? No. You have no information about it whatsoever? No, all I know is a whiskey bottle garbage can. And you were just taking a photograph of what was on the scene when you got there? Yes, ma'am. In Exhibit 347, you talked about bank envelopes and a search warrant tabulation return, which was on a table. Yes. It wasn't hidden anywhere, correct? The, the search the, warrant or the, the tabulation was not hidden anywhere. It was just sitting on a table when you took the photograph? Yes. And you completed the search that you arrived on scene around 2 a.m. and you were done around 5 a.m.? Yes. One moment, Your Honor. Sure. You took photographs of cash. You don't know what that cash was for. That's fair. Because again, you were just taking photographs of what was on the scene when you got there. It was cash in the purse, right? Collect right. Innocent. Thank you. No further questions, John. Just one point for clarification. You said you took pictures for, um, in case there were document any injuries. Did you? Objection, Your Honor. I didn't ask anything about those photographs. She did. I, I, I believe that she did. 
and I, I'm, if, if not, I, I'm offering some clarification. Your Honor, I would object to any questions about the photographs that were taken of my client after he was arrested. I didn't ask anything about that on my cross. Yeah, I did see the scope, the scope cross on my cross. Okay. Right. Is this witness excused? Yes. Can you Thank you. That? Tim Willis. You are a lieutenant, correct? Yes, ma'am. Could you raise your hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give us a true self with that? Yes, Your Honor. Could you step up and have a seat? And then state your name for that third spot and first and last name. Timothy Willis, T I M O T H Y. W I L L I S. May I proceed, Judge? Sure, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. How are you employed? Um, detective Lieutenant with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office? Uh, approaching 28 years. Okay. And you said you're a detective lieutenant right now? Yes. Tell us, please, what that means. Um, I oversee a, a handful of divisions within the Sheriff's Office, the Special Investigations Unit, which I, I, I know we've mentioned at court, um, the Fugitive Apprehension Team, our Computer Crimes, which Detective Wadrowski had worked for, uh, and our Warrants Division. Okay. Um, and we'll get into some of that in a little more detail. Is it, is it fair to say that you're the officer in charge of this case, or one of the officers in charge? Yes, that's fair to say. Just to clear something up quickly, when James Crumley was arrested on December the 4th, 2021, did he have any injuries? Not to my knowledge, no. Now, going back to your role as Detective Lieutenant, um, we've talked a little bit about the Special Investigative Unit. Can we talk a little bit more detail about that? Yeah. Okay, so tell us, please, um, what sort of cases would a member of the Special Investigative Unit handle? Yeah, so the Special Investigations Unit um, is a support services arm of the Sheriff's Office. So we take a lot of requests from other agencies, from our own substations, um, uh, oftentimes we handle uh, political cases, uh, complex cases, high-profile cases, things of that nature. Okay. And prior to your current role, what other roles did you have with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office? Yeah, prior to my role as the detective lieutenant um, of Special Investigations, I was also uh, the detective lieutenant in charge of our auto theft unit, our friend of the court division, um, our arson division. Okay. I'd like to direct your attention to November the 30th, 2021. Okay. Do you remember that day? I do. Were you notified of an active shooter situation at Oxford High School that afternoon? Yes. Can you tell us, please, where you were when you were made, a, made aware of that? I was actually at the prosecutor's office at the time. Um, I was made aware discussing another matter. Um, the prosecutor and her chief assistant came in and advised me that there had been a shooting at the Oxford High School. So what did you do with that? What did you do next? Um, for context, uh, about, I don't know, a couple months before that, we had a false alarm, if you will, at another school. Um, so initially, that was immediately what I went to. Was, uh, this is probably another false alarm. But I picked up my phone, and I made a phone call. I've thought about it a million times. I have no idea who I called, but I do remember the re response was, this is a real thing. This is real. Okay. So tell us what you did, please. Um, I obviously, I, you know, ran downstairs or took the elevator downstairs, ran to my vehicle, and immediately proceeded to the um, um, Oxford High School with my lights and sirens activated. Okay. Um, do you recall the approximate time you would have arrived at Oxford High School? I think it. Around 1.20 in the afternoon, approximately. Okay. Tell us what you saw as you arrived at the scene. There was the largest emergency first response that I've ever seen in my career, and second place isn't even close. Um, when I got there, there were uh, students were being evacuated, and... Um, and, you know, more and more officers were rushing in. Um, EMS was on scene. I, if I, I, I vaguely recall a hel our helicopter flying above. It was just a, a 
something I'd only seen on the TV before, nothing I'd ever experienced. Okay, so at the, that point in time when you arrived, was the scene still active? It was, okay. yes. I'm going to show you what's been admitted as People's Nine. Is that screen in front of you working? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. So this is a map of the Oxford High School? Yes, sir. Okay. And as you pull up on scene, you made those observations. Tell us where you went next. Um, uh, just understand there's a lot of the, the, the day that I don't recall very well. Um, so I don't remember where I parked. But I do remember um, going through um, the front office entrance area. Um, it would be, you see Office 200? That door right there? Yeah. This door right yeah. here? Yeah. I do remember going through there. Um, it was being held open by officers. Um, and that's where I met uh, then Lieutenant uh, Todd Hill, who was the incident commander. Okay, what's an incident commander? So, um, Lieutenant Hill had assumed incident command because, as you can imagine, I, I explained to you there, there was so much um, disorganization in the early. I mean, we had no idea what we were responding to. Um, our my police radio was blowing up with calls of, you know, we think there's an additional shooter here. We think um, someone's fleeing from the scene here. I mean, it was just it was chaos. Um, so. Lieutenant Hill assumed that role and started uh, organizing resources for the uh, sweeps of the school for any secondary explosive devices or uh, any additional um, shooters um, to identify victims, things of that nature. So that was going on as I arrived at the school. Okay. So... <clears throat> We've identified you as, and you're, you know, you've identified yourself as the officer in charge of the investigation. That's correct. That's different than incident commander, though? Yes, the incident commander is a role, I mean, especially in a case like this, um, it, because of the hundreds of uh, emergency uh, first responders that were flooding into the school. Um, Lieutenant Hill, he's a captain now, so if I use him interchangeably, that's. But Lieutenant Hill at the time um, handled the. the uh, securing of the building, the building um, and evacuating um, wounded, injured, and I, because of my role in the Special Investigations Unit, the fact is that I was in charge of the Special Investigation Unit at the time, I assumed the role of the, of the investigative lead, which is often referred to as the officer in charge. Okay, if you could please give us a little bit of an idea of what an officer in charge typically does in the case. So, an officer in charge of an investigation typically, um, at its most basic, we investigate the scene. Meaning, we determine what property needs to be or what evidence needs to be collected, um, what witnesses need to be identified and spoken to, um, identifying potential victims, things of that nature. We also work with the prosecutor's office um, to determine charges. The, whatever charges, if any, are, that are going to come from the incident. Okay. Now, would it be fair to say that in this particular case, there's a massive amount of information that was reviewed? Yeah. So the interest, the, the one of the more problematic things about this case was is the amount of information that was coming in. If you can imagine um, social media tips and, and emails and everything like that, uh, 911, 911 calls coming in. Um, it was just, it, it was information overload, and all the best we could do was, you know, just try to process um, things as they came. Okay. Now, um, so it would be fair to say that you've reviewed the evidence in this case, at least in a uh, supervisory role. Yes, that's correct. All right. I'm going to start off with your testimony where we left off the last few witnesses, and um, I'll go through the, the exhibits that have been admitted already. This is exhibit 361. So a little bit of background here, uh, sir. Were you made aware that the defendant, James Crumbly, and his wife, Jennifer Crumbly's phones were seized the evening of November 30th? Yes, as part of the, um, if I can back up just a second. Sure. Um, so I, as the OIC, I, 
there was a point in time where I, I advised, that, and it was just announced basically, that if you're an investigator, come see me, because I knew there were so many things to, uh, jobs that needed to be done. So uh, a handful of investigators were sent to different hospitals, area hospitals, whether we knew that there were victims there or not. We, we, had, we had some reason to believe that there were victims being shipped everywhere. Um, Lieutenant Mars Band um, was handling, uh, when we had, once that the shooter was identified, um, handling the scene at the, the shooter's um, address. Uh, Special Agent Brandon had come up to assist me in identifying the, um, the murder weapon. So there was just, you know, as, and I actually had a scribe next to me just jotting down as fast as she could um, when, I would, when I would make an assignment you know, who was doing it and what the assignment was because it was just it was still a ton of information. So I think we'll back it up a little bit a little bit further. Okay. Um, now you're aware of when James Tremblay was charged with involuntary manslaughter. Yes. Okay, when was that? Um, he was charged with involuntary manslaughter, uh, I believe it was around noon on December 3rd. Okay, so the shooting was Tuesday, November 30th, and there's Wednesday, December 1st. Thursday the second and Friday the third. That's correct. Okay. Now tell us, sir, what happens when someone is charged with a felony in Michigan? So when uh, the the prosecutor um, authorizes a charge, gives it to the officer in charge. I take it before a judge, and I swear to the facts of the case. It's called a swear to, um, and then the judge determines whether or not the information held within that complaint. The warrant is sufficient to support a charge. Okay, is that public or is that done in private? That's all public. Okay. And did you do that in this particular case? I did. Okay, you personally? I did. <coughs> and there was also, was there also a swear to of the defendant's son? Yes. Okay, would that, that would have been no Wednesday, December the 1st, 2021? That is correct. Okay, was that likewise public? Yes, it was. Okay. And when I say public, I mean open to the public. Well, there were, yes, open to the public and media present. Okay. Um, was James Crumbly there for that, for his son's swear to? Objection on irrelevance. Judge, the jury's going to get an instruction regarding 4.4. Uh, a lot of the evidence is regarding the timeline of where they were from November the 30th to December the 4th well, in the I early think, morning. I think where they were and the knowledge they had uh, is, is relevant, so I'm not allowed. Thank you, Judge. Um, sir, Wednesday, um, December the 1st, there was a swear to the defendant's son? That's correct. Okay. And was James Crumley there for that? He was not in person, no. Okay. And he was on uh, Zoom? He was on a Zoom from his, what appeared to be his vehicle. Okay. Thank you. Now, we've already heard from Dave Hendrick, who was, at the time, the sergeant in charge of the Oakland County Sheriff's Office Fugitive Apprehension Team. Part of your role as a technical lieutenant, would, would that be supervising the Fugitive Apprehension Team? Yes. Okay. So did you assign him with his task of locating James and Jennifer Crumbly on Thursday, December the 2nd? I did. Okay. And tell me about that, please. So uh, as I stated earlier, the, the officer in charge of cases presents information, basically, for, to, to make it clear to a, a prosecuting attorney, a prosecuting attorney, um, in discussions with the, the officer in charge, determines um, what, if any, charges are going to come from it. We, uh, at the time the shooter was charged, um, information, volumes of information was going into the prosecutor's office, and there was discussions on uh, December 2nd about the possibility of um, charging the, the shooter's parents with involuntary manslaughter. Okay, is that why you made that call to Sergeant Hendrick, or retired Sergeant Hendrick? Yeah, what we knew at the time, the only thing that I knew at the time, and again, there was a lot of, a lot of irons in the fire, uh, the only thing I knew at the time was is they weren't at their residence. They weren't actively staying at their residence. So I, th I thought it was important that we try to locate them. Okay, so now going back to Exhibit 361 on the screen here, um, you had mentioned that you had assigned Lieutenant Marsban with a search warrant of the defendant's home at 112 East in Oxford. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, and so that occurred on Tuesday, November the 30th, 2021? Yes, sir. Okay, and were you made aware that their phones were seized as part of that search warrant? Yes, I was. Okay, and we talked a little bit about track phone or, or burner phone, how they're referred to interchangeably. 
Were you made aware, did you learn that the defendant and his wife purchased those phones? I was, okay. yes. And so what's in Exhibit 361? So this is a receipt from the Walmart in Lapeer, Michigan, um, and for the purchase of the track phones. Okay, so just for a timeline, this is it. November 30th, 21, 8 at 1 p.m.? That's correct. Okay. This is Exhibit 362. What are we looking at here? This is a receipt uh, for the Holiday Inn Express. Um, for, for the So the shooting was on the 30th. They checked in on the, the 30th, and they departed on the, the next day. Okay. And do you recall where this Holiday Inn Express was located? Yes, this, that's the Holiday Inn Express in Lapeer. Okay. No, they checked out on Wednesday, December the 1st. Did you learn where they stayed that, that day, that evening? I did. Okay, this is Exhibit 365. What is this? Yeah, this is a receipt for the extended stay, um, check-in date for the in Auburn Hills. Um, the check-in date is December 1st, and the check-out date was December 3rd. So December 1st is the Wednesday, the 3rd is the Friday. Um, is this location, we, we heard from retired Sergeant Hendrick about a vehicle being abandoned. Is this the location he's referring to? That's correct. Okay. I'm going to show you what's in this 366. What do we have here? Uh, this is the vehicle we we come to learn to be uh, the defendant's vehicle. Okay. You said they checked out on Friday, December the 3rd? Yes, sir. Okay. Tell us, please, the relative location from this particular a hotel to the closest police department. The Auburn Hills Police Department from that location is basically across the street. It's not far. <clears throat> now, um, regarding Exhibit 361, just so just so we're clear, your it's your understanding that they were actually told to purchase these phones, is that correct? That, that is correct. So okay. uh, Detective Sergeant Bryan, who testified earlier, um, he had advised them, um, or maybe it was Lieutenant Mars Band, I'm, I, I can't recall, but said, hey, look, we, we're, we're taking your phones. Um, at this point, it's evidence, and um, which is common. And then we often advise them, you know, so you have a means of communication because people don't typically have house phones anymore. We just automatically tell them usually to just pick up a couple of um, track phones. Okay. And were they permitted to obtain contact information from their phones before they were seized? Yes, they were. Okay. Now, specifically on Thursday, December the 2nd, 2021, did you or members of your team uncover evidence that James and Jennifer Crumbly obtained cash through withdrawals? That's correct. Okay, this is Exhibit 367. What are we looking at here? This is a, uh, a withdrawal from Flagstar on December 2nd for the amount of $2,000. Okay. Now, Mr. Rogowski, Rogowski, who testified about the burner phones, also mentioned um, replacement phones, so new phones with the port, old numbers ported to them. Did you learn when James and Jennifer Crumley purchased those? I did. Right. This is Exhibit 368. What are we looking? At? What are we looking at here? This is a T-Mobile um, in Owasso, Michigan, and this is the receipt uh, uh, on December 2nd at 11 a.m. 11:17 a.m. Um, and this is where they purchased new phones with their original phone numbers on them. Okay, so this is Thursday, December 2nd. At this point, they were staying at that hotel in Auburn Hills next to the police station, and this was purchased in Owasso, Michigan? That is correct. Do you know the relative distance between the two locations? The, the, it's about an hour's drive per Google Maps. Okay, each direction? Yes, sorry. So we saw the record that indicated they checked out um, of that Auburn Hills Hotel on Friday, December 3rd. Did you uncover evidence that they had obtained more cash that day? Yes, I did. Right. This is Exhibit 367, what are we looking at here? This is a, a withdrawal from Flagstar on December 3rd uh, for the amount of $4,000. Okay. Was evidence uncovered to suggest that they had transferred money from their son's account? Yes. All right, this is Exhibit 370. What is this? This is a Flagstar um, withdrawal from a Simply Kids Savings. Uh, there's two withdrawals. There's 1129. Um, 
In the amount of what? Two hundred ninety-two dollars, okay. and then there's a second withdrawn the thirtieth the following day of three thousand dollars. Okay. What was the balance left in this Simply Kids savings account? The remaining balance was ninety-nine cents. Okay. And that was the day of the shooting, the thirtieth. The thirtieth, yes, sir. Do you know where the defendant and his wife went after they left the Auburn Hills Hotel? Yes, once they left the Auburn Hills Hotel, they went to uh, the address in Detroit on Bellevue. Okay, and that's we heard testimony from Mr. Kirtley and, and the Detroit police officers, 1111 Bellevue in Detroit? 1111 Bellevue, correct. Okay. I'm going to show you portions of surveillance video. We saw some of this earlier. This is different clips. This is exhibits 371 and 372, so 371 is first. And again, so we know the timestamp is actually um, 22 minutes off. I think we've already clarified that. So the record is clear. The actual time here is 10.58 a.m. Is that your understanding as well, sir? Yes, it is. Okay. And just tell us, please, sir, when you see anybody you recognize. Uh, the man walking with his phone, I believe, is the uh, lease of the suite or room or whatever that the, the, the Crumplings were staying in. That was suite 130? 130. Okay. The vehicle coming in is the vehicle that we identified as Jennifer Crumpling's Kia. And the Kia that was left at the Auburn Hills was identified as James Crumley's Kia? That's right. Recognize other individual exiting from what was identified as Jennifer Crumley's Kia? I recognize both individuals. Okay. Tell us who, please. Uh, James Crumbly and Jennifer Crumbly. Okay. And where is the defendant, James Crumbly, in this video? He's in the he's walking up now. Okay. Sorry. Right here? Correct. Okay. Now this is the location they were found at 1.30 a.m. the next day, is that correct? These that is correct, yes. 1111 Melbourne. Okay. Yep. Now that car was pulled in with the front facing forward, is that right? That is right. Okay, did you come to learn that the defendant moved that car subsequent to pulling up at 10.58 a.m.? Yes. Right, I'm going to show you what's been admitted as 372. So then this is just before 4 p.m. on December the 3rd? That's correct.
according to your testimony, this would be about four hours after he was charged with four homicide offenses? That's correct. The, uh, uh, Your Honor, I would, I would object to that question. Um, Mr. Keith indicated that James Crumley was charged with homicide offenses. This is a homicide. I think we've been clear that this is an involuntary manslaughter case, Your Honor. It's, 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 it's a homicide. It goes by both names. It's, the title of the, of the charge is homicide involuntary manslaughter. Right. Okay. You're both right. Okay. Uh, sir, answer? yeah, please. So the, uh, that was at 417. At 4 o'clock was the time that the judge had ordered um, the defendant and his wife to turn themselves in. Okay, so when it when it became clear that they, they hadn't turned themselves in, was their license plate made public? Yes, it was. Was the license plate on the front or the back of the vehicle? In, in Michigan, we only require uh, the license plate on the rear of the vehicle. I've worked fugitive investigations. Um, oftentimes, fugitives will back into a spot to, one, attempt to secure, uh, hide their license plate, and also it's, it's easier to, to get a get away if necessary. Okay. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but there were no arrangements to have a surrender with this defendant or his wife. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So at the time this occurred, there was no plan with law enforcement to turn himself in? No, sir. And in fact, someone with a valid felony arrest warrant, they don't get to choose when you get to turn themselves in, do they? Absolutely not. Now, sir, I want to go back to November the 30th, 2021, um, in the afternoon, you had already assumed investigative, investigative command. Would that be right while you were on scene? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and you said you, you met with Special Agent uh, Brandon while on scene at the high school? I did. Okay. And what did you task him with? I tasked him with tracing, uh, well, frankly, he offered. He came to me and said, do you know the, who the registered owner of the gun was? And at the time, I did not. Um, he testified earlier, and you heard that it was secured in a garbage can. One of our officers, um, upon the arrest of the shooter, pulled out the, the garbage bag portion of it and took just the plastic waste bin and put the gun to, to keep it all centrally located because searches were still going on and whatever. Uh, that officer turned it over to me. I took my post in the front office there. I sat it next to me. Uh, at some point during the day, uh, Special Agent Brandon came to me and said, hey, have you identified the owner of this weapon yet? And I have not. So he's like, I'm the ATF. It sounded like a really good idea to have him um, track this down, and he, he got right on it. Okay, and was that information relayed back to you fairly quickly? It was. And did you learn that that murder weapon was, in fact, purchased November the 26th, 2021? Yes. Now, you learned the identity of the shooter while you were still at the high school, is that right? Yes. Okay. And you mentioned earlier that you had tasked Lieutenant Marsban with securing the family home and securing a search warrant. Yes. Okay. Now, at that time, did you know if there were any other casualties outside of the school? We did. We did not. I like I said, I I gotten some some in, um, information from uh, area hospitals that. Um, some wounded were coming in, so at that point we're like, well, there's several hospitals in the general facility, so we had to assign officers out to, to different op uh, hospitals to make sure that um, we could locate and identify any potential victims. Okay, so when you sent officers there, you didn't, you, they didn't know what to find, what to expect? No clue. All right. Um, now, at some point, was there a concern about explosives in the school? Yeah, so as I was stating earlier, uh, I was getting sent and others were getting sent and observed Twitter now X posts, Instagram posts, YouTube videos, and we had came across the, a YouTube video of the defendant's son making a um, secondary explosive device, potentially um, more commonly known as a Molotov cocktail, um, and detonating it. Um, we at the time, and we'll talk, I guess, about the journal, um, we found some information in the journal that suggests that there may be um, 
secondary devices in place within the school that prolonged our, uh, my ability to go and investigate the scene of the crime because we had to continually sweep to make sure the, the area was completely safe. Okay, and in fact, did you have to call on a specialized unit to handle that? We did, uh, th yes, uh, Cap uh, Captain Hill, he um, activated the uh, Michigan State bomb, bomb squad with their bomb dogs, and they came in with their robot. Now, were you able to determine what area what room or area of the school specifically the shooter left right before he began shooting? Yes, it was the bathroom adjacent to room 258. Okay, I'm going to, have to show you what's been admitted to people 16. What are we looking at here? This is the, the uh, backpack and contents that the shooter was seen, observed wearing, walking into the bathroom prior to the, the shooting beginning. Okay, now was this photograph taken after the Location was made safe by the bomb squad? That's correct. Okay. And they didn't find any explosive devices? I they, did, they did not. Okay. Um, now, what do you see in this picture? What was seized as evidence? Um, the most obvious thing is the, you see the book open, that is the shooter's journal. Okay. Um, did you have the opportunity to review that journal? I did. I have. All right. Were you able to identify it as being written by the shooter? Yes, sir. How are you able to make that identification? Um, there's, first of all, his name's in it. That was the most glaring way to, to identify that it was his. Um, his. His writing is unique and it matched um, some homework and other writings that we saw. There's references to several incidents that occurred um, in the school um, within the month of November, things of that nature. Okay, so you from the content, content of the journal itself, you're able to put a time frame on when the journal was likely written? Yes, sir. And tell me about that. Um, the first, the first uh, um, date written would have been November 9th, um, but it did reference incidents that happened before that. Okay, in the month of November? In the month of November, okay. yes. As well as incidents that happened after that in the month of November? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, how many pages of writing are contained in that journal? Uh, 22. Okay. So is it is it filled with writing from front to back, or is it at different parts, or, or how is it organized? No, it actually appears to be written from back to front, and it stops about a quarter way through. Okay. Now, of the 22 pages, is there, I guess, a, a title page or, or, or something to signify the end of the, the journal, end of the writing? There's... Yes, I mean, okay. to answer your question, simply yes. So out of the, the pages with writing in that journal, how many contain reference to the school shooting? All, all 22. Now, for the record, I'm, I'm going to show you some of these slides, or some of these passages, rather, from the journal, and I'm going to refer to them by page number, and just so you're clear, sir, um, they're indicated page one from where the writing starts to page 22, which would be the back binding of that journal. Is that accurate? Uh, understood, yes. Okay. Now, is the journal in written format or drawings contained as well? Both. Okay. Were there any passages in this journal that you noted indicative of the shooter's request for mental health help? Yes. This is People's 359. Can you read what's written in this passage, please? Yes. I have zero help and help is bolded for my mental problems, and it's causing me to shoot up the fucking school. Okay. This is page five, well, for the record, that was page six on the journal. Same exhibit, page five, could you read that please? Yes. I want help, but my parents don't listen to me, so I can't get any help. Okay. That's page five. This is page 19, what does it say? <clears throat> My parents won't listen to me about help or therapists. All right. Now, were there any journal entries about the shooter's desire to obtain a 9mm handgun? Yes, sir. Same exhibit, page 3. Can you tell us what this is, please? Yes. Um, the shooter writes, So we should be bound to get my SD9VE soon. Okay. Now, that specific... Term, SD9VE. Did you see that anywhere else in this case? 
Yes, I did. This is people's 85 and 86. What do we see here? This is a picture of a Smith & Wesson um, model number SD9VE um, that was for sale that was um, extracted from the defendant's phone. Okay, and Mr. Rogowski testified this was from Monday, November the 8th, sent from the defendant's son to the defendant in a message that was deleted. You were here for that testimony? Yes, I was. Now back to the journal. This is page 22. Can you please read us what this says? Yes. The shooter writes, I want to shoot up the fucking school so badly. Soon I am going to buy a 9mm pistol. Same exhibit, page 17. Go ahead. All I need is my 9mm pistol, which I am currently begging my dad for. And page 22. I will this, is the, well, this is the binding, right? The, the binding, binding. correct. Go ahead. I will have to find where my dad hid my 9mm before I can shoot the school. Okay. And page 15. <coughs> Unfortunately, my dad does not want me to get the 9mm gun, and we ha are having financial problems, RN for right now, and I don't have a job, so now I pissed because I want to do the shooting with a 9mm pistol as they are effective for killing. Are in right now, all I got is a Puny 22 LR Keltec that I don't know where my dad hit it. Okay, and we heard evidence in this case that James Crumley obtained a 22 caliber Keltec pistol in June of 2021. Is that right? That is right. Yep. Okay. Were there journal, journal entries regarding the shooter's plan? Yes. Okay, here's page three, same exhibit. Can you read this, please? I'm about to shoot up the school and spend the rest of my life in prison. Sir, did you find any journal entries regarding the shooter's um, access to the 9mm? Yes, I did. Same exhibit, this is also page three. Go ahead. Excuse me. First off, I got my gun. It's a SP-2022 6-hour, 9mm. Second, the shooting is tomorrow. I have access to the gun and the ammo. I am fully committed this to, for now, to now. So yeah, I'm going to prison for, the, for life and many people have about one day left to live. Now, sir, we saw one of the journal entries that had the word help, all bold, that uh, was across a couple of lines. Were there any other writings or passages in that bolded format? Yes, there were, sir. Were there pictures in the journal as well? Yes, there were. Okay, like what? Um, there's a picture of what appears to be an arm fully extended out with a gun um, pointed to the back of what appears to be a female's head. Okay, and was that a little picture or a large picture? In it? it took up about that much of the page. Okay, so to reference... Oh, I'm sorry, about three, four inches of the page. Okay. Now, was this journal a full-size book, like this legal notepad, or was it smaller? It was small. I'm just gonna mark this for a demonstrative exhibit. This will be 381. This is a demonstrative exhibit. Papers with it? Objections? No, Your Honor. Just for demonstrative purposes. So you put a pair of gloves and just take that off so you can see it. Hold it up for the jury so they can see, please. And
Thank you, sir. And that's what's depicted here in People 16 that we're referring to? That's correct. Okay. If this if this was laid open. We have first words. Sure. Would you mind putting that back in? Sir, we've heard evidence and we've heard the 911 call that James Crumley made on Tuesday, November 30th at 1.34 p.m. You're aware of that call? Yes, sir. And you were in court when, when it was uh, played? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, we've also heard testimony that the Meyer and Ray Road next to the high school was the emergency location for Oxford High School parents in case of emergency at the high school. The reallocation point, yeah. Yes. Um, and did the police like, likewise notify the community of that as well? Yes, they did. Okay. Do you recall when that occurred? Um, I believe the first the first 911 call of a, that the, the sheriff's office dispatched advised that the Meyer will be the re, re, um, relocation point was at approximately one o'clock. Well, one o'clock in the that day. Okay. So just. Ten minutes or so after the um, shooting. Okay, so the shooting began at 12:51 p.m. is when 1 p.m. the same day. Yes, sir. Right. Um, are you aware how many 911 calls were placed to dispatch in that time period? Yeah. It, Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Yeah, how is it relevant? He's going to testify as to who identified their son as the shooter, Judge. Okay, but that's not relevant. How many 911 um, existing? That's not relevant. How many people identified their son as a shooter? Just one. Okay. Nobody else? Nobody else. Was there more than one 911 call? There was. Oh, I'm sorry, you're at, That may have been as relevant. How many 911 calls is it relevant? But how, I, I guess out of those, how many? It gives the answer context, right? Okay. How many 911 calls were, were placed at uh, that date? Uh, 112 were able to be answered within. The, the immediacy of the, um, the shooting. Okay, and out of those 112, how many identified their son as the suspect? Just one, the defendant. Thank you. Okay, um, sir, as the officer in charge, you've reviewed the surveillance video of Oxford High School. Yes, I have. Okay. We're going to play that now. Judge, could you please instruct the media not to film? Can you remind me how long it is? I just want to decide whether or not we're going to break first or after. It's a just a few minutes, Judge. Okay, I think it was going to be one. Okay. Um, it, it might be a good idea to break right after. Okay. Um, can you uh, not videotape the uh, uh, video that we're about to play? Um, and I, I also want to alert any uh, victims or victims' family in the courtroom that we're about to play the video. Your Honor, I am objecting for the reasons previously stated. I understand. May I proceed, Judge? Sure. Just so we understand the date and time, we have a time stamp and date stamp at the bottom here. November 30th, 2021. This is at 12.46 p.m., is that right? That's right. Okay, I'm going to... And the prosecutor, it's the correct, there's no audio. Correct, there's no audio. Um, let me know, please, when you recognize the shooter in this frame. Okay. He just walked out and made a left. You'll be able to see him more clearly momentarily. He's right about to enter right now. Okay. The the individual turning into the bathroom there is the defendant's son? That is the defendant's son, yes. Okay. So for the record, this is 12.46 p.m.? Correct. And this uh, video is, uh, it skips with time delay, is that correct? Yes, sir. This is 12.51 p.m.? Yes, sir. Okay.
We have a break, Jeff. Um, yes, uh, Lieutenant, you can step down, um, but you may not discuss your testimony with someone. All right, All right you can step down. We have about a 10 minute break. All, right. All rise for the jury. Please remain seated while the defendant is here.
Are you ready? Yes, Your Honor. So we're clear that was um, Mr. Bogrowski testified to nearly 100 surveillance cameras and he spliced the video together? Yes, sir. Okay, so that was just was depicting the same time, but just different angles of the same hallway? That's correct. Okay. Sir, could you tell us please who was wounded on November 30th? Uh, the wounded were, was Phoebe Arthur. Elijah Mueller, Riley Franz, Kali Osage, Molly Darnell, John Asciutto, and Aiden Watson. Thank you. May I approach them? Sure. This is admitted as People's One. Sir, what have I handed you? This is the uh, autopsy protocol for Hana St. Juliana. Okay, sir, who, who was killed November the 30th, 2021? That's correct. This is exhibit five. Sir, how old was Hana? She was 14. And how did she die? Okay. I'm going to object to the reading of the autopsy protocol under the record. He's not it's reading. He's not reading the autopsy protocol. Um, they're being admitted as exhibits um, one through four, correct? That's correct, Judge. All right. So I think it was a question. A question. How, how did she die? She uh, died of multiple gunshot wounds. May I approach the ones? Sure. This exhibit two. What is that? This is the autopsy pro protocol for Madison Baldwin. And this is a picture of Madison and people six on the screen? Yes. How did she die, sir? She had a uh, gunshot wound to the head. And she was 17 years old? Yes, sir. This is exhibit three. So what have I handed you? Autopsy protocol for Tate Muir. Okay. And he was 16 years old. And how did he die? He died from multiple gunshot wounds. And this is exhibit four. That's an autopsy protocol? Yes, sir. Yeah. This is for uh, Justin Schilling. He was 17 years old. And how did he die, sir? Died of a gunshot wound to the head. And those are the four students who were killed inside Oxford High School on November the 30th, 2021? That's correct. Okay. You testified today that you were 
at the prosecutor's office? I was. And you were advised, you said by the prosecutor and her chief assistant, that was the chief prosecutor, Ms. McDonald. Correct. And her chief assistant came to the office where you were, where you were discussing another case. Oh, uh, we were in a conference room in their office and they came, yes. The prosecutor asked you about these swear twos that were conducted both for the charges made against him and the charges alleged against um, his son as well, the charge made against his son. Do you recall those questions? I do. And the prosecutor confirmed with you that the process for this weird two is open to the public. That's correct. You said that both the public and the media were present at the weird twos for both um, Mr. Crumbly's son and also Mr. Crumbly. That's right. For Mr. Crumbly's son, you made note that Mr. Crumbly was not present in person for the swear to in the arraignment. Yes, I stated he was on, on he was there on Zoom. And if you recall, um, his son was also on Zoom for the arraignment. Is that correct? His son was in custody. Okay. Yeah. But they were they were um, he was not there in person in custody. If you recall. That's correct. After the Oxford High School shooting on November 30th of 2021, do you recall receiving tips and receiving information um, and were made aware of concerns for the safety of James and Jennifer Crumbly after their son's name had been made public, if you recall? I don't recall that. Do you recall that their residence had been identified publicly? I don't recall it, but if I can explain, I think um, I do know that there was media was there, but I don't recall it being released anywhere. If that makes sense. And and I don't. I'm not suggesting that law enforcement released that location. Um, obviously, you talked about the social media posts yes. that there was a lot of information coming into you and your department. Um, there was a lot of information being made public that wasn't necessarily true. There was a lot going on at the time um, on November 30th of 2021 separate from the tragedy at the school. That's fair. You said that on November, I'm sorry, December 2nd of 2021, that you and the prosecutor's office were having discussions about possibly charging James and Jennifer Crumbly. That's correct. You know that at some point on December 2nd of 2021, not necessarily the, the nature of the, or I'm sorry, not the content of the discussions, but the nature of the discussions about potentially charging was made public. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. If you recall, there were media reports and information put out into the media that James and Jennifer may be facing charges. That, that may be true. Uh, at that point, I, I was completely involved like there was things that came out in the media that people tell me about today I have no idea about because I wasn't yes and you had a lot going on and and obviously when I ask you a question I'm just asking you I, questions I about what you know about I understand you knew on December 2nd you testified today that you knew on December 2nd of 2021 that James and Jennifer Crumbly were not staying at their residence yes um, you knew that they'd left on November 30th of 2021. Correct. And that was before charges had been announced, announced against them? Yes. And before there was any sort of information that may have been made put into the media that charges may be forthcoming? Yes. That was, in fact, the day of the actual Oxford High School shooting that they stopped staying at their residence? To my, my understanding, yes. The prosecutor showed you Exhibit 362, which is a Holiday Inn Express um, receipt, correct? Yes. And if you recall, the room was registered to Jennifer Crumbly. I believe you. If you recall. I don't recall, okay. but I believe you. You know that um, at some point on December 1st, James and Jennifer left. Oh, and before I go past that. Um, you also know that on, D on November 30th that James and Jennifer Crumbly obtained those, obtained those track phones from the Walmart in Lapeer. Yes. And we looked at that receipt as well. Yes. And you testified that you learned during your investigation that there was a conversation either with Detective Sergeant Brian 
or Lieutenant Marsdan about James and Jennifer obtaining those phones. Yes. Um, and the purpose was because um, they had given their phones to law enforcement and they didn't have any way to communicate with people, if you recall, the information they were given. They were taken in a search warrant. Whether they gave them to, I guess, is subjective. But yeah, they, they were. We, we obtained them, and it's my understanding the advice given to them, which again is an uncommon, is that purchase some track phones so you could maintain communications. Exhibit 365, you know that on December 1st of 2021 that James and Jennifer left that Holiday Inn in Lapeer and checked into an extended stay in Auburn Hills. What day did you say? December 1st of 2021. Yes. Now Lapeer, for those who aren't familiar, is north of Oxford. It is. Um, it's north of Auburn Hills. It is. So they left the Lapeer area and came down to Auburn Hills, which is 15 minutes south of Oxford. I could be wrong about the time. Um, but you referenced La La Lapeer essentially borders Oxford. Okay. And on the north, on the north, on the north side. side, and then you got Rochester. I, Twenty minutes. I don't know. Okay, I, I won't lock you into a time. But they came and, and they came slightly south of still in Oakland County, correct? Yes. Okay. You noted specifically that there was an Auburn Hills Police Department across the street from the extended stay. Yes. Now you know that Jennifer and James Crumley checked out of the extended stay on December third of two thousand twenty one. Yes. Which was that Friday. Yes. You don't know what time they left the hotel, correct? Um, if the checkout's on the... But do I know? No. You know what time checkout is? Yes. Based on the, on the receipt and the, the documents, correct? Yes. But you don't know what time they left. Whether if it was at checkout or before, you have no idea. That's right. At some point on... Uh, in exhibit 368 is the T-Mobile receipts from the T-Mobile in Owasso. Okay. Those are dated December 2nd of 2021. Okay. If you recall. Yes, I do. And there was some conversation about the distance that Owasso is from Auburn Hills because on December 2nd of 2021, James and Jennifer Crumbly have been staying at the extended stay in Auburn Hills. Yes, and I believe they went to Owasso to get their phones. Right. They drove to Owasso to get their phones and then went back to the extended stay from what you understand. Yes. So they didn't stay in Owasso, correct? Overnight, to your knowledge? To, no. Okay. Now, you are aware that after the Oxford High School shooting, there were a, a variety of reactions and emotions to what occurred at Oxford High School. Yes. There was terror. From whom? Anyone at the school. More than likely. There was anger. Uh, uh, are we, are you just talking in general? In general. I, 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 I would guess after an incident like that, every emotion imaginable could be right. put out there. <clears throat> You're aware that once the identity of the shooter at Oxford High School was made public, you were also made aware during your investigation that a lot of that anger or some of that anger was directed toward the parents of the shooter, James and Jennifer Crumbly. I can't say specifically, no. Exhibits 371 and 372 were the videos from 1111 Bellevue in Detroit. You noted that there was a, a difference of 22 minutes on the timestamp on the video from the actual time. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the video was 22 minutes ahead of what the actual clock time was, if you recall. I think that's right. Okay. The video, I believe it's 371, shows that James and Jennifer arrive at approximately 10.59 a.m. at 1111 Bellevue. Okay. And that was prior to the swear to that you testified was conducted at noon. Um, 
that I believe it was around noon, correct? Okay. And again, I'm not I'm not asking you to lock in on the exact time if it was 12:01 or 12:02 or, or whatever the time may be. But 10:59 is obviously before around noon. It is. And the two videos that you were shown, that Exhibit 372 is after 4 p.m., where it shows that James Crumbly walked out of the uh, the building and turned the car around and then went back in the building. Yes. It, was it 417 or something like that? Correct. So the two clips that you saw, there were actually many, many clips from throughout that day, if you recall, that you've reviewed as part of your investigation. Yes. In fact, as part of your investigation, you reviewed those clips and know that one or both of James and or Jennifer Crumbly were in and out of that building on more than one occasion on December 3rd of 2021. I'll be, I don't recall. Do you recall that there was video of James specifically leaving the building to smoke and going back in on more than, more than one time? I can't say. I don't know. And we heard you were in here when um, Investigator Creer testified. Yes. And he talked about finding, I, I believe he said, 14 cigarette butts next to the Kia. Yes. In the 1111 Bellevue parking lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you don't specifically recall whether or not James and Jennifer did leave the building. You don't recall whether they didn't. It's fair to say you just don't recall. I, that's right. You testified that at 4 o'clock, a judge ordered James and his wife to turn themselves in. Yes. You don't know whether James had knowledge of that order from the judge. I mean, it's safe. I mean, it's, there's some evidence in my mind that points to that, that he's aware. You did not see anything in your review of the case and of the evidence that you've obtained in this case to suggest that James was not going to turn himself in. I'm, and I'm not asking about anything that you've seen that you may or may not be able to talk about, but I'm asking specifically, you haven't seen anything to suggest that they weren't going to turn so himself in. So not to object to the form of the question. He can't try to pigeonhole a witness if he has more information and then limit the answer in his base of knowledge. Well, it was kind of a long question, too. Yes. So, but you're specifically ask, asking him your Honor, I'll rephrase my questions a little bit because it was multiple questions. You asked, and we heard the testimony, you asked retired Sergeant Hendrick to locate James and Jennifer Crumbly on December 2nd of 2021. That's correct. That was on the date that there were discussions about potentially charging James and Jennifer Crumbly. That's correct. On December 3rd of 2021, um, they had not been located at that time, uh, it, earlier in the day. What time? Um, before dark. No, they weren't located. They were to located. My knowledge, they weren't located. Right. To your knowledge, they were located later in the day, um, and and we heard the testimony about that information. Correct. Yes. You testified about um, a, a video. I believe you said it was posted on Twitter of the shooter. A Molotov cocktail or something? Uh, it was. I believe it was a YouTube video. Okay. You have no information that James was aware of that video? No. Now, Exhibit 16 is a photograph of the backpacking contents in the bathroom that we looked at. Okay. Um, the photo shows that the journal that was in the backpack was, was open, and I believe you testified that that was open by law enforcement. Um, I, to be honest, I'm not, so if I can recap that, uh, the Michigan State Police Bomb Squad went in there, they arranged, um, the items to my understanding, and that's how, the first time I saw that, it, it was, that's how it was. Okay. So you, you don't know, have any specific knowledge about how that was opened or who opened it, you just know that when you saw the, the, the contents, that that's how they were, as they were in the photograph. Right. 
You identified the journal as that of the shooter because his name was in it. Yes. Among other things. Right. You said also the writing match homework that you saw and things of that nature. The first date that you have written in the journal you testified was November 9th of 2021. I believe that's right. Okay. You, you indicated that there were references to incidents prior to November 9th of 2021, but you don't specifically know what the dates were that those incidents were written about. Is that fair? I, I think I might. Based on reading the journal? Um, based on everything I've read. Okay. So based on everything you have about, every, all the knowledge you have about the case that you learned after November 30th of 2021, you may have additional information. Yes. But looking at the journal, it, you can't tell from the dates. There aren't dates other than November 9th of 2021, and, and I think there might be a couple other ones referencing the shooting. You're correct. Okay. You testified that the journal appears to be written from back to front. So opening the front cover, there would be no writing, but if you flip to the back, then it's the 22 pages from the back forward that have writing on them. It seems that way, yes. And again, I think this is an obvious question, but I'm going to ask you. You have no indication that James Crumley was aware that that journal existed, correct? No, I think I know he knew it existed. That that journal existed? Yeah, he mentioned it in his counseling session that he, why don't you write, you know, you can write in your journal. Right, and we tested, or I'm sorry, we heard from the counselor and we heard from the um, Dean of Students, who both testified that there was a mention of a journal, but that there were no specific, specifics given. It doesn't say the journal in your backpack, the one you always keep with you, he didn't provide colors, he didn't provide any descriptive detail. We saw in the search warrant photos that were taken that there were additional notebooks, and I mean, could be journals, in the shooter's bedroom. He references a journal, the, I'm sorry, the, the, School counselor and the dean of students mentioned a journal, testified about a journal. They indicated that James Crumley said, you have a journal. But there's no specifics given about what that journal is. Is that fair? That was a long question. It was a very long question. Yes. There were no specifics given during that meeting at the school about whether James had any knowledge of what the journal looked like, if he knew what was in it, or anything like that. No. Specifically pages 15 and 22 that we have, that were admitted as exhibit 359. On page 15, if you recall, the, the shooter is writing about um, wanting a nine millimeter and then he's mad because he wants to get it because that's what he wants for the school shooting, correct? Can we put it? Yes. In fact, I can hand this to you because I don't have it electronic. May I approach your honor? Sure. Thank you. It's flipped open to page 15. Thank you. You're welcome. So, I'm sorry, what was your question, Counselor? Page 15. Okay. There's some mention about the shooter wanting a 9mm gun. He wants it for the school shooting. Um, and he's mad that he, he hasn't gotten it yet. I'm not. Yes. Okay. He's pissed. Pissed is the word he used, correct? Page 15 also includes this statement. Um, he mentions the Caltech and says he has to find where his dad hid it. Yes, that's what it says. If you'd like to. Yes, I'm going to go to page 22 next, Mr. Keese. Mr. Keese is going to put them on the screen for you. Thank you. Yep. Mary Pro China. Yes. Page 22. If you could go to page 22, Mr. Keys, thank you. 
Was it few 22? Um, page 22, the binding. Which is the number is this? 359, Your Honor. Thank you. Page 22. And again, we discussed that this was written along the binding, so along the, the inside edge of the page, mm -hmm. correct, in the journal? Yes. And it says, I will have to find where my dad hid my 9 millimeter before I can shoot the school, correct? That is what it says. Now, we know based on the testimony that you've heard and you've been sitting in court during the trial, we know that there was a 9 millimeter handgun purchased on November 26th of 2021. Yes. That correct. the shooting at the high school occurred on November 30th of 2021 that the shooter and his mom went to the shooting range on November 27th of 2021. So this portion would have been written at some point between November 27th of 2021 and arguably the morning of November 30th of 2021. Well, now you've confused me. I don't... Um... Well, we know that there was no 9 millimeter handgun in the house until November 26th of 2021, correct? based on your, your investigation. I see the nine millimeter. Yes, yeah. because this specifically references a nine millimeter. It does. This is different than the other on page 15, which specifically references the Caltech. I gotcha. So, although Mr. Crumbly's son says my nine millimeter, we know that there was a nine millimeter purchase on November 26th of 2021. Yes. That he went to the shooting range on November 27th of yes. 2021 and the shooting occurred on November 30th of 2021. Yes. So we know, and, and this page was page 22, which would have been the back the back cover of the journal. Is that fair, if you recall? I, I don't if you don't, it's okay. But we, we can read this and know that it would have been written after definitely November 26th of 2021. Yes. On page three of the journal, Mr. Keys, if you want me to make sure, thank you. Access. Yes. If you look at the third line of this entry, it says, I have access to the gun and the ammo. Do you see that? I do see it. Now, you don't recall seeing anything in this journal or even around this entry that says, my dad told me where the gun and ammo are. Correct? Can you repeat that please? Yes. You don't recall reading anything in the journal that says, my dad told me where the gun and ammo are. I do not. You don't remember reading anything in the journal, you didn't see anything in the journal that says my dad showed me where the gun and ammo are. No, I didn't read that. So when it says I have access, you don't know how he obtained access, is that fair? It just says I have access, exactly what the words are. Uh, I, I, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yes. Reading this, this journal entry and the information that you have that you've read in the journal, this doesn't say how Mr. Crumbly's son had access to the firearm. Is that fair? That's right. Just simply that he had access. Simply that he had access. Understood. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Hey, Direct. Uh, briefly. Thank you, Judge. Uh, starting off with, with the journal here, um, you were asked if James Crumbly knew it existed, and you indicated that you believe that the answer was that. yes. Yes. Okay, so you were here for Mr. Hopkins' testimony as well as Mr. Ejak's testimony, of course, you're the officer in charge of the investigation. In that meeting with uh, James Crumbly, did he say journals, plural, or journal as in singular? Just a singular journal. Okay. And there were notebooks found in in the home, 112 East Knox, we saw a picture of that. But were there any other journals found? There were not. Okay. Um, and you indicated that you believe that you can tell approximately when the journal entries were written based upon the content? Yes. Okay, so I guess we didn't really go over it in, in direct examination, but there was an incident on November the 4th, 2021 at Oxford High School. Was that referenced in the journal? It was. And an incident that occurred November the 11th, 2021, was that referenced? Yes. Did the shooter reference his friend who left the state October 31st? He did. Okay. Was there any indication 
anywhere in the journal that the 9 millimeter was locked up? No. Now we saw evidence in this case that the shooter obtained access to the Caltech pistol as well. Yes. Okay, and that text message was, look what my dad left out. Correct. Okay. And what we have on the screen here, page three, first off, I got my gun. It's an SP2022 six hour nine millimeter. Second, the shooting is tomorrow. We know, of course, the shooting occurred November the 30th, 2021. So can you presume a date on this passage? So this would be November the 21st, presumably? Presumably. Okay. Um, second, shooting is tomorrow. I have access to the gun and ammo. And of course, we know that he did obtain that weapon. We do. Okay. And we know that the murder weapon from November the 30th was the weapon purchased by James Crumbly on November the 26th, 2021. Absolutely. Thank you. Nothing further. Very brief question. Very brief. Very brief. Okay. And I don't mean to belabor the issue, but when it comes to journals or notebooks, you don't know what James calls a notebook, what he calls a journal. You have no idea. Is that I, fair? That's not fair. Okay. I do know what he calls a journal because he called it a journal in the meeting with Mr. Hopkins. Right. He said something about a journal. He did. He, you don't know if he's talking about a notebook. You don't know if he's talking about a journal, like a diary with a lock on it. You have no idea what he's talking about. I got a pretty good idea. He's talking about a journal. That's, that's what I can say. Right. A journal. A journal. The reference to the Caltech that Mr. Keyes just asked you about was in August of 2021, correct? He asked about um, the video that we saw, the text that Mr. Crumbly's son sent to his friend about my dad left it out, LOL, or something along those lines. Yeah. That was in August of 21. Can you show me? I, if you recall. I don't recall. Okay. You don't recall seeing anything from November of 21 um, in the journal or otherwise saying that Mr. Crumbly's son had access because Mr. Crumbly left a gun out in November of 21 or in the journal, correct? Ask that again, please. Sure. You don't recall seeing anything during your investigation from November of 21 that Mr. Crumbly had allegedly left a firearm out in the house and his son talked about it. This is beyond the scope of my redirect. Okay, I still don't understand the question. Sure, Your Honor. Mr. Keyes asked about... Um, the text that was sent from Mr. Crumbly's son to his friend about his dad allegedly leaving a, the Caltech out. Okay. And he filmed the video of himself. Okay. I'm trying to clarify that that video was in August of 21. I mean, if I can, I, if I need to, I'll pull up the, the exhibit, but I was just trying to clarify with the detective lieutenant. Okay, I think if you showed me the exhibit, he'd be able to say, but do you still think that that was from August of 21? Yes. Are we talking about the Caltech? Yes. Sorry. Yes, August 18th, 21, and August 20th, I'm sorry. August 19th. I did it again. August 19th of 21 and August 20th of 21. Okay, let me tell you what it was. Your Honor, they stipulated to the date, so I don't need to ask again. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Uh, I just, based on that, um, there was evidence that we introduced in this case that the shooter filmed a video of himself holding the six hour nine millimeter handgun November 26, 2021. Yes. Okay. And there were also um, Instagram posts of him holding that same firearm on the 27th of the one. That is correct. Okay. And I think I misspoke earlier. I said November 21st, as far as this passage being written, this would actually be November the 29th of 2021. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Sir. Thank you, Judge. All right. Can you be excused? Yes, sir. All right. You can step down and be excused. Thank you, Judge. Tell me where we're headed. Judge, we have no further witnesses today. Before we officially rest, I'd like the opportunity to review our exhibit list. We had a lot of modifications throughout the case. All right. We want to confirm with defense counsel what was extracted and added on. And then tomorrow morning, we'll, we'll know for sure. All right. Do you want 9 o'clock? That's fine, Your Yes, 9 o'clock. All right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask you to return at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, please. Uh, you know, again, that during the trial you should not read, listen to, or watch any news reports about the case. Under the law, the evidence you consider to decide the case must meet certain standards. For example, witnesses must swear to tell the truth, and lawyers must be able to cross-examine them. Because news reports do not have to meet these standards, they could give you incorrect or misleading information that might unfairly favor one side. 
So to be fair to both sides, you must follow this instructions. Do not go on social media, do not post, do not do research, do not discuss the case uh, with anyone. We really appreciate your commitment to this very important job. Um, and we ask you to hang with us just a few more days. Um, we're, we're, we're nearing closings um, within, the, within the week, I, I would think. Um, remember to fill out your lunch form for tomorrow. Um, stay healthy tonight, and don't discuss the case with anyone. Any, any questions about the schedule? Any questions about that? No. We appreciate you. Thank you. All rise right for the jury.